Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the Board of Education for the 138th school year for the Long Beach Unified School District. So it's good to be back and to get started again. Mr. Otto, can you lead us in the pledge, please? I would be happy to. Place your right hand over your heart and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We welcome those who are here for purposes of addressing the board at the proper time and in the order of their request. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item to which you wish to speak. You may also request to give testimony on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda will have to be delayed until such a time as the item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to individual members of the board or to the staff. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's closed session agenda. In closed session today, the board voted to approve a final settlement agreement and general release in an OAH case number 2022030003, providing consideration, accommodations, and a general release. The vote was 4-0, unanimous decision with members Kerr, Craighead, Miller, and Otto participating in the vote. So today's meeting is um, kicking off another chapter of our board governance work. Um, for the last two years almost, we've been talking about wanting to transition our conversations here to be student outcomes focused so that the public was clear that the work that we are primarily considering and wanting to hear at these meetings and the public to hear is around student outcomes, um, how our students are doing, what they know, um, so we've had a series of conversations over the last several months about what that looks like. And one of the things that we knew is that we needed to adjust our agenda to reflect that we wanted to spend more of our time talking about student outcomes. So we've asked as a board, uh, Superintendent Baker, to really work on with the team what that could look like um, and adjust our agenda accordingly. So tonight is that first draft of adjustment. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Baker just to talk about a little bit of where we've been and the recommendations that she's made and what we'll see in the agenda tonight. Dr. Baker. Thank you, and while I'm getting us started, I'll ask Mr. Itson to pull up the Student Outcome Focused Board Governance Update slides. Um, thank you for the opportunity. This is some information that I also presented at our board workshop in July, um, just to name that for the public, but just an opportunity to really re- um, imagine and think about what we want our board meetings to be. Something that has been a powerful statement by our coach from the Council of Great City Schools is that when we change the behavior in the boardroom, what adults spend their time talking about and how they talk about um, student outcomes, it influences everything that happens in our district. And so this is, a, this is a, a moment to be proud as a Board of Education that while it might be a little bit clunky this evening as we try out this new agenda format, it is an opportunity to think about our students in very strategic ways and to hear our staff and folks from the field who will join us to talk about their experience and the way that they are supporting students. Just a few slides to remind us of where we've been. So Ms. Kerr, um, you mentioned two years worth of work. This work did start a couple of years ago. It started in assessing the work of the board, looking at agenda minutes and time spent and studying our practices. And what that led us into was um, a process of thinking about how the board meeting could be different in service to students. We tried out different kinds of presentations and ways of looking at data over the last couple of years. And so what you're going to see tonight is um, an opportunity to, for us to actualize our learning from the last couple of years in new ways. So that first year was spent really thinking about how to be different. It was also spent onboarding two new board members and Mr. Miller and Mr. Otto using their expertise and also building the effectiveness of the, the governance team. Last year, we really worked at the practices of student outcome focused presentation. So you'll remember that oftentimes when we were talking about data, we also had folks from the field or senior staff 
talking about programs that related to that data and not just the data itself. And we'll continue that, that practice tonight. It is the time that community visioning happened for the board last year where you were out in the community asking the question about aspirations from the community and what the community wants to see for their students and, and that will continue. So tonight we're kicking off in this moment, we're kicking off a transition to a different kind of agenda and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, also important just to restate that while we've been practicing differently, this is also a really important time in our district. So the next few meetings will be talking about goals, guardrails, the district's goals, and how to look at data that associates with that. That will continue in every meeting. So tonight's a new format, as I said, maybe a little bit clunky, but each meeting will get stronger as we um, strengthen our practice, but every meeting will have this opportunity to talk about student outcomes. And in a, in a moment, I'll share an image of the calendar that we'll use to actually drive that, those presentations. While that's happening this year, we have important work going on um, in strategic planning. So community visioning that the board has in, engaged in will add to the data that is collected in our strategic planning process. And by the end of this year, not, o not only will we have spent a year in a student outcomes focused meeting structure, we'll also have a strategic plan that, that um, takes us into the future. So again, just a quick reminder, what is the, the purpose of a student focused agenda? It is to prioritize time to be talking more about students and the progress that they're making to inquire about things that would be more supportive of the students who are in our schools. Um, and for the board at a policy level and making decisions about budget, really seeing the needs of our students in, in different ways. Um, what that looks like in practice is a consent focus agenda that takes regular approvals, resolutions, items that come before you in every meeting and requires that you study them, get to know them, ask questions about them with all of your materials so that more time is spent talking about student outcomes and less time is spent in the meeting itself around the business of the district. That is called a consent calendar. And so tonight, members of the public will see you all taking a large batch of items that in the past had been sequenced one by one and voted on as separate items. Now you bring all of your study of that board agenda, you've asked questions of the staff, you've prepared to then take those as a, a consent calendar and to approve them in what will be observed as a batch of items. I, I will note, and in a moment, um, Wayne Stumpfer, our general counsel, will come up and speak to actually that consent calendar, but I'll just say that there's always an opportunity for a board member to engage in further discussion and to take something out of, out of that consent calendar. So tonight, in practice, you're going to see staff a staff report that focuses on student outcomes, and then you're going to see tonight, actually, you'll see a proposed two consent calendars that will be voted upon by the board. Um, before I call Mr. Stumpfer up, just want to show a couple of tools that will be used. The first tool is the district's student outcome facing goals. Um, and for those who watch the meeting and want to find this, it's actually on my webpage on the district website and can be. Um, you can go on the webpage, single click, it gets you to these goals that are in fairly final form, but with input from the board, um, there may be some minor revisions to them, an active document. This is the outcome goals that also will be monitored with the board monitoring calendar. This board monitoring calendar has been laid out um, specifically with the incoming data that we, that we have. Um, Dr. C. Brown, um, as we have assessments that are given in, in the district, uh, his team will be preparing then reports that will come into the boardroom. So ongoing progress as well as summative progress. So tonight you're going to hear some summaries of last school year in the form of iReady data and our Pulse survey, which is social emotional learning data from our students. And during the year, as, as um, the public can also find on that same webpage, can find the monitoring calendar that associates with the goals. Um, and so we will be working hard to stay on this calendar. It, each of the meetings will involve staff who are presenting data and also staff who are telling the story of what's actually happening in classrooms and schools, and you'll meet some of them tonight. So back a little bit back to process, want to ask Mr. Stumpfer to join at the podium just to go through the process, especially for asking for some grace um, from 
the public as we move through our first version of working with the consent calendar um, and what that means for us. So yes, at your microphone, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, President, board members, superintendent. Uh, just to go through real quickly uh, a little bit of the process for the public and for the board regarding a consent uh, agenda or consent calendar. <clears throat> Consent calendar is for items that are non-controversial uh, and that are straightforward and typically approved of by the board. Um, anything that is uh, uh, possibly sensitive or that a board member uh, doesn't want to have on the consent calendar because they want to discuss it and they're not sure they want to vote for it, they may want to debate the issue, those would not go on the consent calendar. So the consent calendar can be treated as one item, as it is on, on the agenda, and so you would just simply uh, ask for a motion, a second, and, and discuss and vote. You can have discussion on uh, consent items uh, if you want to, for instance, uh, give kudos to somebody on a report that's you know, in the consent agenda, or if you want to uh, uh, at least just make a comment about something, you can do that. There's no problem with doing that. But if you want to debate the item, or if you're not sure you want to vote for it and you want to have that discussion, you should pull the item off the consent calendar and we'll, we'll discuss it, we'll put it on the agenda directly after the consent agenda. Uh, the um, other thing I wanted to mention was we would ask that the uh, board, if you do want to pull something from or change it off of the consent calendar, that you do that when the agenda is approved so that staff knows uh, you know, that, that we're going to pull that item off and they have a chance to prepare and be ready for it. Um, so when you approve the agenda, that would be when you would want to say, you know, we'd like to move an item or two off. <clears throat> Another comment uh, I want to make was that I recommend that we do a uh, roll call vote for the consent agenda. Uh, it's not legally required, uh, but I think it's good practice. Uh, we do need to know who's voting and how uh, for these items, and there's a number of items anywhere from 10 to 15 to maybe even 20 at some point that might be on these consent agendas. So I think it's good practice, and also, you know, if there is a, a, a question of a possibility of uh, recusing yourself or something like that, we have to deal with those issues and pull those items off as we are going to do tonight. Um, so that's the idea behind the consent agenda and the process of, of, uh, of going through it. Great, thank you very much. So um, we ask for the public's indulgence as we work through this new system. Um, we're all learners in the room um, and hopefully it will get smoother as we go along. So that was just an information item. We don't actually have to vote on that item. Uh, but we are now at item 10, which is the call for the agenda items for separate action or adoption of the agenda as posted. Dr. Baker, I believe you had some items to pull. I do, thank you. And so, Mr. Sumpfer, stay tuned and let's make sure that I do my items correctly. So I'd like to move um, item 15.6 and 15.9 to a second consent calendar together as items 15A and 15B. And I'd like to pull item number 17.2 from the agenda. Any other items to pull? So I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Great, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 4-0-0. Zero, zero. Item 11, recognition and acknowledgments. Uh, tonight we have the honor of being with one of our great partners tonight, and we're grateful that they're here. The Long Beach Public Library Foundation is represented in the room. I think President Ryan Ballard is here, and I don't know if Executive Director Veronica Garcia de Avalos is with us as well, but welcome. We certainly sent her our condolences as she's memorializing a very dear friend. But again, my name is Ryan Ballard, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the uh, board president of the Long Beach Public Library Foundation. And I count it an absolute privilege uh, to be among you, uh, superintendent, president, members of the board, and 
all others. I, again, count it a privilege to be here. I'm so excited, and hopefully this evening will serve to solidify a very natural relationship between our public libraries and our public school system. It's been at least a few years since anyone from the foundation has represented and spoken to this esteemed body, and I'm including those who are behind me as well. Um, so I am so very thrilled uh, to be here. Uh, our mission, the Long Beach Public Library Foundation provides support to enhance the Long Beach Public Library and encourages literacy and education for all members of the community. I often uh, simplify that to say we promote literacy in Long Beach and beyond. Uh, we are actually in year one post our silver anniversary. We made it 25 years and uh, part of my goal for our board, we are talking about what do we do in the next 25 years. I'm gonna borrow a statement that I heard uh, some years ago at the grand opening of the Michelle Obama Neighborhood Library in North Long Beach and that is, we are not your grandmother's library. I recall the Dewey Decimal System. I learned it in school. Okay, the laughter means that some of you all are familiar with that. We don't use that anymore. You'd be hard pressed to find any librarian or library representative hush you while in the library. In fact, the library is a very dynamic and robust location. It is one of the only public spaces where you can enter Use the place up, and you're not expected to spend any money. We have 12 public libraries in the city of Long Beach. We have raised, uh, the, the, the foundation, just so you know, our goal, we're a fundraising board. That's no secret. We often remind ourselves of that. But we're an all-volunteer board of 26 board members. Uh, we do pay for a staff of four outstanding and exceptional individuals. Um, but we raise money to fill in the gaps, quite frankly. You know, money's always an issue. We, we know that. So the group of individuals just has a love for literacy and really we serve as the voice for the voiceless. Um, libraries, I have yet to meet anyone who has a negative story about a library. In fact, most often I run into somebody who says, yeah, you know, I remember my mom taking me to the library and, and, and you know, that was the only place where I could, uh, you know, travel. Some years ago, uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege of speaking at length to Mother Doris Topsy Elvert and I asked her, it had nothing to do with libraries, we were just chit-chatting and I was interviewing her and I said, well, you know, what, what advice do you have? And among the things that she uh, shared with me, she said, travel if you can, and if you can't, travel by book. No doubt you're, many of you are familiar with the fact that the Long Beach Public Library Foundation funds dictionary days every third grader in the city of Long Beach, in the Long Beach Unified School District, receives a free dictionary and thesaurus, thanks to the Long Beach Public Library Foundation. Many times we have heard from the parents of these children, this is the first book that my child has ever received. Dive into reading, this is one of our programs. Dive into school. Uh, we have a summer reading program. One of our biggest recipients of the funds that we raise is the Family Learning Center. And it is just that, it's for the entire family. It's not just for children, but uh, if any of you grew up in a church similar to mine, it said this is for folks from zero to 99. Makerspace Studios. If you are a YouTuber, if you are an aspiring musician, if you're interested in learning how to sew, you can find that at the library. I invite you, if you have not, you can personally contact me. 
not hard to find. We would love to give you a tour of the Billie Jean King Main Library. Uh, Michelle Obama Neighborhood Library houses many of these same things, the 3D printing, etc. Did I mention we had a music studio as well? In the library. Mobile studio. Our career online high school. I'm going to take liberty and really spend a few moments talking about this. This is a program that we fund for folks who didn't uh, grow up on a flowery bed of ease. These are adults. It's a very, very competitive and challenging program to get into. But for folks who didn't get their high school diplomas at the ripe old age of 17 or 18, like many of us did, they experienced some loss, some challenge, some adversity, but they had the presence of mind to pursue their high school diploma. It was just that important to them. I went to, for the first time, I actually attended the graduation last week. It was held at the Billie Jean King Main Library. And among the eight or nine graduates who were there, a gentleman said to me, yeah, I did it. I had to do it so that my son would know that he had no excuse. Because if I can do it, so can he. Um, this is a tear jerker moment. It is for me. This for me is my why. Why we raise money, why we dig in our own pockets, is because the library <laughs> funds this program. Yes, the local library and, and the foundation supports this. My ask, it's a very personal ask, not because it benefits me specifically, is that this group of graduates is able to take advantage of the college promise that Long Beach uh, supports and, and promotes. Why wouldn't they be able to? Is, is it because we are uh, rewarding failure? Or is it because we are acknowledging their effort to succeed against the odds? I would submit that I think it's option two. So certainly I think if a group, and again, I don't think it's a weighty proposition or a financial burden. In fact, I'm going to stick my neck on the line and say if we need to raise a little bit more money so that this group can take advantage of that program, it doesn't mean they all will. But to afford them the opportunity, um, if anybody's like me, life hadn't always been easy. And so the path to success I have discovered is not a straight line, but a winding road. And so I am certainly advocating for these folks who have participated in our career online high school. The foundation is very responsive. We try to be very intentional about everything we do, from representation to responding to the immediate needs of the community. So just a few short years ago, you all may remember a fellow by the name of George Floyd. It caused quite a stir. Quite honestly, my question was what was so unusual about this situation that uh, it drew so much attention, and I think it was because there was probably a perfect storm of events. When's the last time you can recall being in a pandemic and you couldn't drive? <laughs> but here you have these folks. So we established the race, equity, and justice uh, program so that you can fund, so that we can provide books and access to information so that we can deal with some of these uh, what some might call courageous conversations. Bridging the digital divide. We use data provided by the Long Beach Unified School District when we talk about the impact of the pandemic on students and the access to Wi-Fi and the internet and so forth. So we've heard countless stories of folks who uh, needed the library so they could check their internet. 
one very compelling story was a young lady who said, well, when are the libraries going to reopen again? Because I haven't been able to check my email for six months. Adaptability. We're very aware of the um, those who are differently abled. Investing in our libraries. When you invest in your libraries, you invest in the people in this room and the people, families who are in this room. Uh, I'm not going to go into these numbers of how we, there is uh, quite a uh, divide in, in how the, the funding that Long Beach provides to its libraries, but that's partly why the foundation even exists. But I hope that you've heard tonight that the library is here for each of you and should be available to everyone. And so when you think about your public library, remember fondly the Dewey Decimal System, but then think that, wow, but our libraries are meeting the needs. These were essential workers, and they're meeting the needs of the community. So in terms of our outcome tonight, I would just say hopefully you learned a little something more about your local library and that you will continue to be advocates because that's all the foundation. That's all we are. We're just some big mouths who love literacy. And we think that is just that important. We think if there is an equalizer to be had, it's the library. You can donate, absolutely. I just want to leave you with this slide that has information. If you had any questions, again, my name is Ryan Ballard. I'm available to you. And to you. And where's the camera? To you. I'd love to show you what the library is doing today. So often we hear, you know, the library ought to do this. And we have found that our marketing is not the greatest. And so we say, we do. So this is my opportunity, hopefully, to market the public library and just know that libraries change lives. And I thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Colleagues, any comments or questions before Mr. Ballard heads on his way? Mr. Miller. No, I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think you brought up a really important piece when it comes to uh, the assets that public libraries bring to communities, as I think that we've often considered um, libraries as a place that we store books, mm. and it's not. It's a conduit of knowledge, and there's a lot of uh, academic opportunities there with the music programs and with... Uh, uh, the sewing and programs and all the things that you spoke to. So I appreciate you sharing that uh, with everyone here today. Thanks. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. And I, I, I'll just echo Mr. Miller's statements. If we know that libraries are safe spaces and havens for a yes. lot of our kids and families, um, especially in the after school hours, I love seeing our Jordan High School kids feel so at home at the Michelle Obama Library and knowing that we looked at the design of that library when we were redesigning the media center at Jordan because we saw the spaces that they were attracted to. Um, so I'm personally really grateful for the work that you do. And I know you mentioned it is budget season in the city of Long Beach and there really is some advocacy work happening around increasing that budget so that the libraries can be open even longer That's or more actually. days, especially in some neighborhoods that are lacking. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in listening or talking with Mr. Ballard about ways that you can be part of that advocacy um, as the city contemplates their budget and passes it probably in September. But uh, thank you for being with us tonight and continuing to be a great partner. Thank you so very much. Okay, 11.2, uh, student, staff, and school celebrations. Actually, we have none tonight. So we're gonna move on to public testimony on items listed on the agenda. Um, so you have up to three minutes. I will say that we have a couple extra. would love for you to, to consider that um, lots of folks want to speak tonight on items on the agenda. Um, so we'll call you up. I think Mr. Suarez, I, I couldn't hear him from here, but I think he was giving you instructions at the time. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. So first up, we have Joan Claire Richter. Welcome. Thank you. Bring the sound a bit. Is that on? 
Good. Okay, great. Um, well, greetings, board members. I'm Joan Claire Richter, the senior senior regional organizer for the Pacific for the Climate Reality Project, which is an environmental advocacy organization founded by former Vice President Al Gore. I thank you for your time today and support for Board Policy 3510.1, focusing on a transition to renewable energy for the Long Beach Unified School District. And thank you to the Green Schools team, led here in Long Beach by Diana Michelson. I've been on staff at Climate Reality for almost four years now, and I've helped lead our Los Angeles chapter for a year before that. The protection of the planet is important to me because I grew up as an outdoors wom woman, and part of protecting the planet means protecting the people that live on it. I am a Southern California native myself. I grew up in Sierra Madre, near Pasadena, if you know it, and I started working in public schools in North Pasadena when I was a teenager. My mother started a nonprofit to enrich Pasadena Public School curriculum through the arts. I saw the power then of enriching the public school system with accessible, community-based solutions. 20 years later, I'm here, yes, 20 years later, <laughs> I'm here to continue that work in my own field of environmental grassroots organizing and make sure that these students, teachers, faculty, and Long Beach Unified School District employees have a safe, clean workplace to work in and learn in. By supporting this resolution, you are taking steps to protect the health, both physical and mental, of these students in this school district. Children face special risks from air pollution because their lungs are growing and because they are so active and breathe in a great deal of air. Because this is a public school system, I would also add the importance of the accessibility element here. Frontline and fenceline communities, which are affected first and worst by the climate crisis, make up many of the neighborhoods you are serving. The impacts of this decision span beyond the grounds of all schools in the Long Beach School District and into the health and wealth of all of the families, students, teachers, and associated staff. A just transition to clean energy through accessible and community-based solutions is the key to solving the climate crisis without leaving people behind. So I applaud you and encourage you all to see the value of this policy because it, because it is just the type of work that Mr. Gore encourages and we facilitate and support. Within our over 40,000 volunteer base, this youth-led decision will make a wave and we'll, I will do everything in my power to ensure that I support that. Lastly, taking this stance will set a precedent for schools across Los Angeles, California, and the Pacific Coast, as well as the rest of the country, to also transition to clean energy. So thank you for stepping up, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paige Zwerner. Hello. I'm... Uh, I'm Paige Werner. I'm an incoming senior at Poly, and I'm going to be the ASP president for the upcoming semester, as well as I'm an intern with the third district council person. I'm here to remind you of how important this vote is to the future of all LBSD students, because as a student, many of us find it difficult to make our voices heard, especially since most of us are not of voting age. You, as our board, are our voices and our representation. We beg you to hear us and to vote to transition away from fossil fuels, and please vote for Board Policy 3501.1. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Congratulations on being ASB president. Next up, we have Danielle Hidari. Hello. Good evening, members of the board and everyone who's here. Um, I'm so grateful to be here with um, the Long Beach Green Schools campaign um, in support of Board Policy 3510.1 on green schools operations, committing the district to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, my name is Daniel Heydari. I'm a Long Beach resident, um, and I work for a climate non-governmental organization called Pacific Environment. Um, we are a global organization working on clean ports issues. Um, and I am so grateful to have worked with Diana Michelson on our campaign to transition ships um, that enter the port of Long Beach off of fossil fuels. Um, our campaign for zero emission shipping 
um, has transformed the landscape of the possible when it comes to climate ambitions. The largest international ocean shipping company or one of the largest international ocean shipping companies in the world, Maersk, um, thanks to the grassroots advocacy that we've done here in Long Beach, accelerated its climate ambitions by a decade. And so that shows that much more can happen and it's an incumbent upon policymakers and decision makers at every level from the school board to the local to the state to the federal to be taking steps to mitigate the climate emergency and transition our society off of fossil fuels. Um, if we don't take rapid action to have global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and then ultimately eliminate them by 2040, we risk deadly heat waves, power outages, wildfires, hurricanes, storms, the unimaginable. Um, so I really urge you to please um, play a leadership role here in Long Beach, a frontline climate community um, in transitioning the school district off of fossil fuels. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dia Rubio. Welcome. Hi, so yeah, my name is Dia Rubio and my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm an incoming sophomore at Long Beach Poly High School and I've been with the Long Beach Poly Green Schools campaign since eighth grade. So this is personal story. So earlier this summer, I was traveling in Alaska and I hiked with my family to see a glacier. So at first my reaction was like, whoa, that is a glacier, it's huge, it's amazing. But then there was kind of the other thought that was in the back of my mind the whole time I was there. And it was, I probably will not be able to show this to my children. So the glacier, it's called Grunke Glacier. It's retreated over 1.5 miles since 1950. And there's not much left of it. It won't be here much longer. So I grew up right here in Southern California. So throughout my childhood, I've just watched the climate crisis go from bad to worse. I've seen the firefighters the wildfires, they get more and more frequent, and I've seen them set off my asthma. I saw the sun turn red for the first time in fifth grade. I've seen grass get drier and drier. I've watched droughts come more frequently, and then they go, and then they come again. So I've grown up as most of the kids these days have in this world that's slowly been burning. So at that glacier where it should have been, I was so sad and so afraid. I want to hike with my children to that glacier someday. I want to go to my childhood beaches and look at the ocean when I'm older. I want to run in the rain that is coming more than twice a year. I want to raise kids without feeling guilty that I am bringing them into a dying world. So this policy, policy 3510.1, I don't know, there's lots of numbers, but it's not going to single-handedly fix the climate crisis, but it's a step in the race, I would know I'm a runner, and with enough steps, a race is one, so we have to take the step for all of us and for our futures. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Katie Allen. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Madam President, members of the board, my name is Katie Allen, a second generation graduate of Millican High School, and I'm also a mother of a LBUSD incoming kindergartner. Um, I also serve as the executive director of Algalita Marine Research and Education. We're an international nonprofit headquartered right here in Long Beach that specializes in environmental education. I'm here today, like so many others, to encourage you to vote yes on board policy 3510.1 to transition Long Beach Unified to 100% clean, renewable energy. A yes vote and your commitment to push forth the goals in the document will prove to our students and our community that the decision makers within our school district are bold and willing to embrace complexities and take up the challenge. This district has already shown its incredible ability to reshape even the most rigid systems. Because of the pandemic, many things have changed forever, but the changes did not happen on their own. This district prioritized change, followed new regulations, revised budgets, 
and shifted the operations and behaviors of over 67,000 students, their educators across 85 schools within a matter of months. There is no doubt the leaders of LBUSD are capable of systems change. In fact, after everything we've been through, I believe you are masters of it. While the sustainability challenges we face today are very different than what we have faced throughout the pandemic, the opportunity to lead by example is no different. So again, I urge you to vote yes on policy 3510.1 so we can begin the important work that I know this district and its students have the grit and determination to push forth. Thank you for all of your hard work and for your dedication to our community. Thank you, Katie. Our next speaker is David Perzinski. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is David Perzinski, and I'm the managing member of a local small business, Long Beach Solar. I've worked with clean energy for the last decade around here, and I'm in absolute support of this green energy, uh, green schools program. So right now, the, the timing is so important. Yesterday, the federal government just signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes over $369 billion for climate and energy-related programs. This signals a clear message and offers funding, which makes your policy even more feasible. Also yesterday, Long Beach signed their Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Much of what you might already be familiar with as many of their outreach campaigns have included feedback from your schools. So this includes an aspirational goal of reaching net zero emissions by 2045. Today, what will Long Beach's schools do? So both of these programs really highlight the value of education and job creation. For the local and federal initiatives to pan out, they really are relying on the educational system for collaboration. With each step that you take to get closer to 100% decarbonized, there is a valuable learning opportunity to inspire students and to educate, to get them ready for the 21st century green energy jobs. And as a local business, I can tell you with personal experience that these green energy jobs are real. Uh, are real. Uh, the careers are out there and companies are hiring. Uh, companies like mine are looking for the schools to help encourage the development of our future employees. So there really is no time to wait. Uh, the time is now. I know you guys will make me proud to be living here and I'm excited to have children that can benefit from the decisions that you are making. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Dave Shukla. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. My name is Dave Shukla. I'm a, uh, well, I'm the co-founder and uh, operations director of a climate science nonprofit, the Long Beach Alliance for Clean Energy, uh, here to speak in uh, support of 3510.1. Uh, our nonprofit was founded in, in late 2017 when lead was found in the drinking water at Cal State Long Beach by the chemistry students of one of our members, uh, Dr. Elaine Bernal. As you know, lead uh, significantly uh, impacts uh, not only children's health, uh, but development and uh, learning outcomes. Carbon pollution isn't as bad. Uh, but some of the associated compounds with a lot of our local uh, sources of pollutants, VOCs, NOx, SOx, a whole list of uh, chemicals, uh, greatly uh, impact learning outcomes and student health. Um, this policy is a great start. Um, I was at City Council last night until midnight. Uh, it is budget season. Um, I, I'd like to strongly urge you in the formation of the task force to include parents, perhaps from PTA, as well as students, uh, younger students, and most importantly, that you recognize these investments are, at best, assets that can be used in perpetuity, things that can be maintained, things that can be built upon, and things that once we break from fossil fuels and all the risks 
and poor health and social outcomes associated, we won't ever have to again. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Our next speaker is Stella Ursua. Welcome, Stella. Thank you. Hello, board members. Thank you for uh, having me. My name is Stella Ursua. I'm a Long Beach resident, and I'm also the Senior Programs and Partnerships Manager for Grid Alternatives uh, for the LA office. Um, as my friend David mentioned, what a week we've had so far. The Inflation Reduction Act, the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and I'm hoping that we make it a trifecta tonight with updating the energy policy, uh, energy and sustainability policy for uh, green schools. I am so impressed with this group of students here. Uh, we met with them about a year and a half ago, right, Diana? And they came to us and said, hey, we want you to join us. We want you to support us. And we said, absolutely. Anything to do with solar and clean energy, we're there, right? But they are so smart. They're brave. They're committed students. Uh, I'm so impressed. This is what we've been waiting for, right? We're waiting for students that are committed to fighting for uh, cl fighting climate change, influencing their school board to make the necessary changes to current policies, and committing to a very heavy lift uh, of transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energy, uh, and to create equitable and healthy schools throughout Long Beach. So your vote tonight. Um, I really appreciate what you all started with tonight, the uh, student outcomes focus. I say that if you vote yes, you're demonstrating your commitment to a student outcomes uh, focused uh, agenda here by voting yes for the green schools, operations, and energy uh, and sustainability policy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stella. Our next speaker is Rudy Cardoso Peraza. Welcome, Rudy. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Rudy Cardoso Peraza, and I'm with Long Beach Forward. I'm proud to say Long Beach is my home, and Long Beach Unified School District served as a district where I received my education, beginning from preschool at Lincoln Elementary, culminating with high school at Millican. And I am here tonight to support and applaud the hard work and dedication of these students right behind me to commit LBUSD to clean energy. For the past two years, the Long Beach Green Schools campaign's commitment alongside other partners have proven to be a great vehicle for local change and sustainable development towards environmental action. These, these youth are already champions of environmental justice, when in reality, they should just enjoy being kids. However, you know, the current times are pressing and, you know, they're pretty challenging. And I'm really proud to see, you know, see youth take action for themselves to ensure that they have a cleaner, healthier, more breathable future. Board Policy 3510.1 promises an important, necessary, and ambitious series of changes that will benefit LB students and communities. So I urge, urge you all to please vote yes in support um, to pass the updated Green Operations Policy. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Rudy. Our next speaker is Lily Palmer. Hello, LBUSD board. I'm Lily Palmer, an incoming junior at Millican High School, and I'm here with the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. I attended my first board meeting with this campaign almost nine months ago in December of 2021. When I was planning this speech, I was a little shocked by that number. The time has flown by, and it honestly doesn't feel like it's been that long. I think the biggest reason these nine months have felt so short is because we've done an incredible amount of work in that relatively short amount of time. At that board meeting in December, we were still campaigning to pass a resolution committing to clean energy by 2040. Today, you're voting on a policy update that we've spent hours drafting, editing, and perfecting. I wanted to say thank you for enabling us to get to this place today. Thank you for being willing to compromise. We're so grateful that instead of hearing, no, we can't pass this, we were told, let's find a way to make this happen. Let's find a way forward. Even at the last meeting in July, I'll be completely honest, we were not expecting the vote to be postponed, but we're so glad that it was because it's led to a document that we're more satisfied with. I've heard people say that compromise is a bad thing because no one ends up happy, but I think in this case, we've been able to work together to create something that we're all very happy with. So thank you for being willing to work with us, and I hope that you're happy enough with this policy to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Our next speaker is Diana Michelson. 
Hello, LBUSD Board of Education. Um, two years, six days ago, the campaign was founded. Uh, like Lily said, well, I've been going for about I, 12, 12 months now, a little under because we went to the first October one that was in person for the school board meetings. It's been a long, long journey. Uh, but I think that what I want to actually talk about today, I want to keep it short because we have more important things to do. We have a board policy to pass, if we're being honest. Um, but I want to highlight actually a meeting I had with Dr. Baker. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, but our first meeting, it was nine months after the campaign was founded. Um, as you can imagine, we were all really nervous in our Zoom room. You couldn't really tell, but you know, we were like jittery if you had into the cameras because having the support of a superintendent is obviously crucial for something like this. And after the meeting, Dr. Baker, you said, thank you so much for working with us, not at us. And those words have stuck with me because, I mean, at the most basic level, as humans, the most basic human phenomena, phenomenon is we want to feel included. We want to feel belonged and we want to feel heard. And while you have helped provide us, an I mean, sorry, while, you know, you were mentioning that you've provided, that we've provided you an opportunity to, for that, you guys have done that for us. Like I mentioned before, you have quite literally let us put words from our resolution into this board policy. It is so cool, and I'm sure that you know Ruthie, Emma, and Lily, and Rohan, who've been really working um, a lot with the document, can agree that seeing our comments that we've put in the draft of like suggestions, having that be put into the document is just amazing. So with that being said, thank you for thank you for working with us, not the other way around. Thank you today for working with us. And hopefully we can continue that because obviously this isn't the end of it. We have a task force. This is an ongoing project. Like Dia said, this is just the beginning of the race. And like Lily said, like I'm going to repeat over and over again in this speech, thank you for working with us. And yeah, thank you, sorry. I'm really excited for today and I really appreciate all of your support. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Diana. And our, our last speaker on items on the agenda is Trustee Sunny Zia from Long Beach City College. Well, um, how do I follow that? Uh, what an inspiring cr crowd you have tonight. Um, We've learned around here you never want to follow the kids, so I I'm know, sorry. it's so amazing. So good evening, members of the board. Um, um, President Kerr, Vice President Diana Craighead, thank you so much for leading the resolution on the agenda tonight, item 15.16. Uh, um, I'm here in my capacity as the president, co-president of American Association of University Women, AAUW, to speak to you. Um, as uh, President Kerr mentioned, I am also a trustee on the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees for nearly uh, eight and a half years now, serving my second term, going for the third term. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how, what, the importance of what you're going to do tonight and hopefully will pass. Um, I really appreciate the uh, agendizing of the 50th uh, anniversary of Title IX. Um, our branch has been in existence over uh, 102 years um, and it's been, uh, the mission has been to advocate for gender equity and women and girls. We are part of the national office with branches in every state, Guam and Puerto Rico, and there are over 170,000 members. It is a pleasure being here to, uh, today to celebrate this historic passage of Title IX. Here's part of the reason Title IX became the law of the land. AAUW has had a history of producing numerous groundbreaking studies to advocate for improved public policies for women and girls. The history about Title IX, uh, how it came about after World War II, AAUW spent two decades serving colleges and university campuses. And documentation found that the late 1960s, most schools and, uh, had practiced widespread discrimination against women at all levels of higher education, from students to trustees. In 1970, 250 institutions faced charges of sex discrimination. AAUW made national news by distributing guidelines to the presidents of all four-year institutions in the country, and Title IX was enacted into law on June 23, 1972. I know my time is limited, so I just want to uh, touch on some of the um, areas that it pertains to you. We've been working with your 
uh, school district um, for the past two decades um, uh, offering Title IX middle, for, for middle school girls exposure to the field of science, tech, uh, technology, engineering, and math at our annual STEM conference. Uh, nearly 3,000 have participated over the years, and um, it's been quite a journey and a partnership. Before I conclude, I want to acknowledge that I have my fe fellow AAUW member and past president, Shelley Arnold, who is one of your own teachers here. And I uh, recognize uh, that my time is up, but I really appreciate your time today and really applaud you for recognizing Title IX and the 50th anniversary. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that concludes public testimony on items listed on the agenda. So we'll move to public testimony on items not listed on the agenda. I have one speaker tonight, Tim Gilmore. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Tim Gilmar. I started a nonprofit, uh, Poly Alumni Association, became president in 2019, called Long Beach Poly Alumni Association. I am talking to you tonight basically about three things that I'd like to discuss. Uh, one is the naming of Coach Don Narford's football field after him and his wife. Two is honoring John Rambo and getting him a Walk of Fame star. And three, uh, is trying to get uh, Long Beach Poly football back at home for a limited amount of games uh, when it's financially feasible. Coach Don Narford basically has won 18 state titles, 25 CIF titles, <clears throat> and he's done numerous things throughout this community and stuff. He's also helped train Ariana Washington and uh, Rashawn Nelly, high school Olympians, who went on and have done great things too as well. He's also done things with football as a football coach. He's also helped out in training and, and coaching um, people like Willie McGinnis and Sean Jackson and so forth. But more importantly thing that he's done is he's also helped out with kids keeping them on the straight and narrow path. Kids that might have not been an NFL stars but he wanted to make sure that they had a good Christian values and such. And so it's, think, very appropriately that we work towards naming the football field after him and his wife. Uh, and somehow the paperwork was started in December of 2019 and has somehow been stuck up in bureaucracy, I guess. But anyways, uh, the other thing I want to discuss is honoring John Rambo. And as you know, John Rambo was the first Olympiad in 1964 in Long Beach. And he's done a lot of things, not just being an athlete uh, and, and as a poly alum and playing basketball and sports, but also coming back and giving back to the community, which I think is really important. He helped start the youth leagues and such. And so I think it's very important that we honor him with a Walk of Fame star. And the alumni have all chipped in, and so the Walk of Fame star is actually been paid for. We just need to figure out a way to get it up there and honored. Uh, Keith Lilly, class of 72, does have it. And the last thing I wanted to talk briefly about is obviously trying to get varsity football back to Poly High School, which I think would be really important. It would save money. The coaches want to do it. It would improve the morale. And also, um, it would really make things a lot better for the coaches in the program and such. Uh, the last thing I want to discuss also to throw in, um, there is going to be an MLK uh, school supply giveaway and which is organized by Marcus Hobbs and sponsored by Suli Saro, City Council, and Eric Miller, too. Right, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Gilmore. Okay. Okay, so that concludes public comment. Um, item 14 is next in staff report, and as chair, I'm actually going to choose to move the consent calendar to the next item to... Uh, in support of the folks who are out here to do this. Our uh, staff report could be rather lengthy tonight, and we'd love to have folks here um, who worked hard on some of the items on the consent calendar. So we're gonna take the consent calendar. Um, so I'll entertain a motion for approval of the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. So for discussion, uh, 
Again, this is not up for, these are things that are not gonna be debated among the board members. They're going to be simply uh, recognitions and call outs, um, kudos kinds of things. I know Dr. Baker, you just wanted to offer a point of clarification or allow Mr. Zayd and Mr. Miranda to do some clarifying <laughs> yes, of two items. Both of them I'd like Thank um, you. Mr. Zayd to have an opportunity to address um, item 15.12 and Dave Miranda 15.15, .15, just to provide some context. Thank you, Mr. Zayden. So I know that there is a lot of excitement, so I'll make this as, as brief as possible. So on December 1st, the Board of Education unanimously voted to adopt our Excellence and Equity Board Policy. That was exclusively developed by a team of parents, community members, and district staff. The purpose of the policy was to establish a common foundation of equity that would be implemented throughout Long Beach Unified School District. This summer, a small group had an opportunity to participate in a week-long study to really take a look at its implementation and to ensure that implementation was widespread with fidelity all throughout our district. Um, two things came out of that. That was one, taking a look at the Long Beach Unified School District understandings and expectations for quality core instruction. I believe that each one of the board members were provided with a, a copy of that. And the second component of that was to take a look at our code of ethics and to, uh, and to revise that to represent our code of excellence, equity, and ethics. And so tonight what we're bringing before you is the first stage of that revision, which is only taking a look at the purpose and the section, the commitment to students, which is now aligned to our quality core instruction. We do plan throughout the year to, to take each individual section um, and to bring before you further revisions. But stage one tonight is just that commitment to students to ensure that as we start the 22-23 school year, um, that we start the year with fidelity to what a commitment to students and quality core instruction actually is in each one of our classrooms. Um, there is more that I can add, but I'm gonna pause right here. I will say that um, students have had an opportunity to weigh in and give input, and I was going to read some of those student statements, but we have so many students in the audience who are like, let's move this a little faster that I'll just pause right there. Thank you, um, and I think we're gonna ask Mr. Miranda to come forward just to talk about uh, the small changes. We've been talking about this uh, sustainability policy, this Green Schools campaign work for a very long time, and so there were just some minor changes that we just wanted to call attention to before any vote is taken. Perfect, thank you so much, and good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Baker, our senior team, our audience here, and our wonderful audience in the overflow room. So I did promise everybody on the Green Schools campaign I'd wear a tie with green this evening, so mission accomplished, <laughs> step one. Um, but really more so wanted to highlight some of the changes here, right? We've been stressing and presenting on this very board policy for some time via a number of board presentations over the past several months, uh, but we've made a few minor yet major edits, right, from, from last month to where we are now. So since then, um, in reactive direction and, and request of the board members, uh, we made a few edits with respect to adding an aspirational date and, and, a, and a goal to the policy itself. This is in alignment with the state goals and also with where we're trying to go as a school district as well. Um, with doing that, there was also a few other edits that just corresponded to the state goal and I'll highlight what some of those changes are. So first and foremost, we made a slight change to the title, right? So you now see the word sustainability listed in there. Previously, it only noted energy policy, and we thought it was fitting. So already within the policy and the goals themselves, we highlighted things such as um, water consumption, vehicle emissions, and so forth. So we felt it was just more appropriate to include the word sustainability within this policy itself. Um, also added uh, really a change to the reference of the source material uh, with a more relevant source. So we added AB and SB32, just as a point of reference. Uh, those are very much in alignment with the state goals as well in terms of energy and sustainability. Um, added a brief statement of urgency. So already we had a lead into the policy language itself uh, with a number of just different sentences and paragraphs that, that led us to where we want to go, but added just one more line there to further stress where we are and what, just what the climate situation is for all of us. 
And then last but not least, we added a few sample projects. So the goals remain unchanged, right, in terms of just the, the meat of the policy. Uh, it includes three goals, including uh, maximizing the use of renewables, new re replacement machinery and equipment being zero emissions, phasing out older uh, machinery and equipment, and of course, reducing vehicle emissions. So those are still the three primary goals embedded within the policy, yet we included just a few line items um, that listed sample projects is what I would say. Um, we also took to heart just what we heard that particular evening at the last presentation in terms of at Long Beach Unified, we do more, right? So yes, we wanna be in alignment with the state goals, but we absolutely will aspire to, to beat that target, right? And do more as a school district. So that's very much where we're looking to go, looking to go faster where we can and as budgets allow. Um, wanna emphasize the fact that the board adopted a facility master plan recently, which includes sustainability, throughout the master plan and actually calls it out as a specific project priority category as well. And also wanna emphasize just that importance of the task force itself. So we'll have regular check-ins with that particular group once we establish it. We'll be able to report back to the board on our progress and just where we are with respect to each of these goals. Um, and we look forward to doing so. And last but not least, just wanna thank everybody here, right? So the school board superintendent for the support and guidance, everybody on the Green Schools campaign, several folks who participated, right? So there was parent groups, other stakeholders from the community, specifically want to call out Diana, Emma, Lily, Rohan, and Ruthie, because it was just an absolute privilege working with every one of them, right? So I actually get somewhat emotional. It was just a cool process, um, something Alan Rising and myself speak to regularly. So we often present at industry conferences and talk to our counterparts up and down the state, and we often just give extra kudos to every one of these kiddos here and every kiddo in Long, in Long Beach Unified. So really because of their efforts, we th see that sustainability is gonna be at the forefront of all of our discussions and planning efforts, and we look forward to, to continue to work along this line. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Um, so we'll take it back to members. Mr. Miller, any comments, kudos, observations on the consent calendar? Yes, I absolutely just wanted to uh, send my congratulations and uh, thank you to everyone who uh, put had any effort and input um, into our uh, sustainability policy. Uh, it's important, not f just from a district standpoint, but our young people uh, said it best as we're talking about uh, the next generation and what they will get to experience. And so understanding that this is uh, just one bite of the larger elephant in the room, which is uh, our planet sustainability, it's an important bite. And so I know that everyone has been working really, really hard, uh, especially our young people in the green uh, in the audience. And so I just wanted to thank them and recognize all of their efforts. Thank you. Mr. Otto, any comments? Kudos on the consent calendar items. I just wanted, like uh, Mr. Miller, to congratulate the students who have been working so hard for so long to uh, get this policy in place and uh, to open the eyes of people in the district to the importance of these climate change activities. As it was noted earlier, the uh, city council last night adopted the uh, cl climate adaptation uh, plan and. Uh, with that, uh, I think the city and the school district is at one in moving in this direction. So thanks for all your hard work. You've uh, opened the eyes of a lot of people at the district. Thank you. Ms. Craig, had any comments? Kudos on the consent calendar. Um, yes, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our partners, the AAUW um, and uh, Shelly for being here and Sunny Zia earlier, she had to go, but um, thank you for uh, bringing forward that Title IX acknowledgement. It's been 50 years. I can't believe that. Um, <clears throat> I was going to try and avoid saying that I was uh, in school before that happened, but no, I said it, so that's it. Um, but you guys have been such great partners with the, um, the STEM conferences for our eighth grade girls. I know you have other projects in the works. And I know we're gonna be able to work together, so thank you for that. I know a lot has been said about our energy and sustainability plan. We've talked about it a lot. I, I feel like at our last meeting, we really extended our, our gratitude and we 
um, said a lot, so I'm not going to belabor the po beleaguer the point. But anyhow, thank you very much. I'm very proud of the collaboration between staff and students, and how we we were able to come to a point, and I, and I know it was said before where it's a compromise where everybody wins. You can't say that about everything. So thank you, everybody involved. Thank you, Ms. Craighead, and I'll just add in my remarks. So it was December 16th, 2020, 610 days ago that I first had a Zoom call with the Green Schools campaign. Uh, Mr. Gologli, I had known uh, from a previous life as a parent, reached out to me and asked if I would sit with these kids um, on a Zoom call and, and hear them out on the things that were important to him. And shout out to him, he is dropping his child, first child off at college, so sending him all of those good thoughts. Um, and I remember that Zoom call really well. We were you know, knee deep in the pandemic and you were still hopeful about doing incredible work to change the world. Um, and I remember telling you that the district at the moment was singularly focused on keeping kids safe and making sure that they were educated, but that we absolutely had an interest um, in the work and that I personally had an interest in the work. Um, since then, you've brought, um, not including tonight, almost 70 speakers to our board meeting over the last year, um, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I am, so yeah, the, I, we went back and counted so that we would have that number. Um, and just hundreds of hours that you've spent uh, with each other and also with our staff, and kudos to our staff for working with you. Um, this is the most intentional commitment to environmental sustainability um, at a structural level, I think, in district history, and that's a big deal and I'm really grateful that this is where we are today. So I wanna thank you for your patience um, and your persistence and your partnership in that work today. Um, it's really critical to us moving forward. I know that when I left that meeting and you know I've seen Diana and Ruthie and Rohan and Lily and Emma and Paige and Dawn and all of you over all of this time, my intention that day was to you, for you to feel like you were heard and valued and respected and that we wanted you to be part of the process. That I think I said, I don't know where it's gonna go, but I know that we need you alongside us in the process. So 610 days later, it's a pretty incredible result um, for hanging in with us. Um, so as it was mentioned, the, Long Beach, the city of Long Beach passed their climate action and adaptation plan last night, and as the largest landowner and employer in the city, we have a special obligation to continue the work. I will note that we were on track to do this last month without those last little Tweak, so we know that this has been about a partnership for our greater community. Um, we know that LBUSD includes more than just Long Beach, and so we wrap in all of those families and kids throughout the LBUSD community that may not be uh, who live in Long Beach. But I look forward uh, to working with the city and with you all in the mechanisms they have for accountability, the task force that we will have for accountability uh, to improve the health and livability of our city. I want to thank, again, staff for their time. Um, and incorporating our student leaders and the public in a really meaningful way in this process. Um, I think it's a great model for, for how we will continue to work together to tackle really big issues. So once again, I know I believe deeply that co-creating policy together with all of our stakeholders is the way that we move forward um, with strength and unity. It's how we all have buy-in to the success and I look forward to what's next for the work that we will do together. So those are my comments on the consent calendar. Any other comments on consent calendar before we call for a vote? Okay. So as is our new practice, we'll do a roll call vote on the consent calendar. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Craighead. Aye. Mr. Otto. Aye. And I vote aye. So it passes 4-0. Uh, oh, any of opposition? Any abstentions? <laughs> I have to do, that's, that's the legal way, I know, according to Brent. Um, so that passes 4 Zero and no abstentions. Congratulations. <laughs> Students, you want to join us up here? We can take a picture. Whatever you would like. Yeah. Balloons, signs. Oh, 
All right, why don't you come up here and join us? Like, that was so good. Good, good. Okay. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Okay. I, so um, I always take my cues about the gavel from Ms. Craighead. She said I should use the gavel. Again, thank you all. We're going to pull it back. Um, and go back to item 14, staff report. Dr. Baker. We have a second consent calendar to you approve. Do that now too? So let's just proceed with that, Mrs. Craighead. Okay. Um, these were the two, just to summarize, these were the two items that were pulled from the first consent calendar. They can be approved together. They're item 15A and 15B, which replace finance report B and purchasing and contracts report B. So they are now, they can now be voted upon together. Okay, and I'm recusing myself from participation in 15A and 15B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees or the awardees. So I will pass this over to Ms. Craighead to administer the vote. Thank you. For item 15A, finance report B, We need a motion. Oh. So moved. Second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Otto? Aye. And I vote aye. So hearing no abstentions, that's three in favor with one abstention. Um, I'll go right into 15B, purchasing and contracts report B. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Otto. Aye. And I vote aye. So that would be three in favor, um, zero against with one abstention. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Craighead. Again, we said it was going to be a little clunky. We'll get there. Um, so, Dr. Baker, we're going to move on to our staff report, which is about student outcomes monitoring. Yes. So we have a team that are going to be a team that is going to be presenting tonight, and I will kick us off. Um, I shared some slides that I'm going to make reference to, but not put the slides back up while our team gets their slides ready. When we talked about board governance, I ended with two slides. You have full-size copies of them. They are the district goals, 2022-2023 goals, and the data monitoring calendar. Those are both available on the website, I'll just repeat, under my webpage and under goals. And so I, I want to start there just to call attention to the four goals that are the district's goals this year and then just share a tiny bit about them before I, I pass to Dr. Brown. So the, the, the goals that our monitoring calendar will sync up with this year are as follows. Goal one is LBUSD students will achieve at least one year of academic growth, and students achieving below grade level will demonstrate greater than one year growth. The addition to goal one is that the median student growth of black students will be at, the, at least 25% greater than the previous year on iReady assessments. And I just want to hover there for a moment because tonight you'll be hearing from the team about iReady growth. And so you can think about these three parts to the school. These are academically facing goals that are for all students with a special focus on students who are below grade level and their acceleration of growth, along with um, a specialized focus on our, our black students who have lower rates of achievement than we expect. The second goal, um, and we actually saw a great demonstration of agency this evening in our students. The second goal, and you'll hear about this tonight, relates to our students' social emotional learning and wellness and that goal is increasing student sense of personal identity belonging and agency and again you'll hear dr brown dr lund and members of his team talk about and, and dr simon members of her team talk about our efforts both in the past and also going into this year around the increase of students identity belonging and agency the third goal is LBUSD student access to and success in post-secondary options will increase. You will hear, um, not as much tonight, but in the data monitoring calendar, you will hear about our efforts around math achievement, high school readiness, college readiness, and a leading indicator, which is our A through G rates, with a specific focus on the achievement gap that exists between our black students and others um, in their attainment of A through G completion rates with a specialized focus on ninth graders and the cohort that is beginning in our high schools right now um, and specific monitoring about that cohort as it moves up through the high school years in attaining A through G completion. And then lastly, a goal that pertains not as much as the student outcome, but a goal that is around the, the experience that our students have in our classrooms. And that goal is to center and improve upon the, the quality of instruction in all of our classrooms in new ways. That's because our, our students have shown us that they have different needs and incumbent on us is to support teachers in having the tools, the supports, the structures, the training to meet the needs of what, who, who our students have shown us they are and what they need. And then I'll just do a specific um, call out to a new tool that is taking, as we have evolved as a district, you have heard us talk about the understandings continuum, a tool that was first implemented, developed and implemented in 2018 that described aspirations around instruction in classrooms. We've learned a lot since 2018. Um, and so what's before you in a booklet form, it's also available under you on our district website, the, the revised version, and will be in the hands of every single teacher in our school district in the coming weeks, is the understandings and expectations for quality core instruction. This document, if I think about being a teacher, which I loved being a teacher and love the work with our teachers, is a place where teachers can find coherence around the expectations of classrooms. It's a, it's a guide with six areas of understanding that range from equitable and inclusive learning environment to setting the stage for student engagement, evidence of student learning, equitable instruction, and planning. 
Um, with our evolution, Dr. Kale and her team, with uh, Angelica Gonzalez as lead, engaged with teachers, students, um, administrators, and other staff to revise what was our understanding continuum to be an expectations document. Teachers can find, no matter what they teach, if they teach a 12th grade English class or kindergarten or third grade, they can find um, a focus on practices that research has shown improve student outcomes. And so the reason that quality core instruction is part of our student outcome goals is because the, the time spent in classrooms, the classroom experience that students have and their interaction with teachers is the number one factor that influences student achievement. It is the number one thing that changes outcomes for students. And so our year will be spent in continuing to study the evolution of our practice, to centering culturally competent classroom practices, and ensuring that our teachers have the training, the supports, the materials, the guidance in unit guides and lesson guides to implement quality core instruction in every classroom as our journey. The second most important factor um, relating to student outcomes is principles. And so together, and this is work that we are engaged in and will continue to work at together, we've got the number one factor, the number two factor in a school building. And what happens in a team that supports all of those people is what is important. So when you think about the, the amount of time that we're gonna talk about student outcomes and asking those questions about how are we supporting teachers and how are we supporting principals, anchored in a set of goals and a data monitoring calendar is the work of our district and, and our senior team in the year ahead. Um, something that's specific that I hope as teachers come back to their, their buildings and are working with their principals, setting goals for their classrooms and our schools are setting goals related specifically to their achieve, the, the, the achievement in their building, is that they'll see a line from district goals to classrooms and from classrooms to district goals and everything in between. So I think about a coherent system has alignment from big, broad district goals to levels. You'll hear over time, you'll hear Mr. Moskovitz and um, Dr. Len tonight, Dr. Camarino talk specifically about level work and then the support offices will talk about their support to levels, to buildings with the specifics of their data, to classrooms. And so what I, um, what I see in a coherent system is all of these systems speak to one another. So tonight's the beginning of um, engaging the board in that same conversation. The data, lastly I'll say, the data monitoring calendar that's also uploaded and available for, for viewing is the way that the board will have access to um, our student data on a regular schedule in every meeting. So this is that moment where the consent calendar gives time. It makes time for the conversation about student outcomes tonight, starting with the Pulse survey from spring, the social emotional learning data from spring 2022, and iReady growth data. Um, if there are adjustments to be made to the calendar, we'll make them, but this, the agenda has been set around what is available in terms of monitoring student progress throughout the year. Um, the data that you are going to receive, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of student data. Our focus will be on reporting outcomes by race and ethnicity and special populations every time you have data in front of you because that's the conversation we want to provoke. Um, and lastly, each of the school offices will be, they, have, they actually have their own data monitoring processes that will cascade from the board, um, the board monitoring. And so from this point forward for this year, we're setting the stage for what will be the work of the entire district around these four goals. With that said, Dr. C. Brown, as you are being referred to, I will pass it to you for the kickoff of tonight's conversation. I like Dr. C. Brown. It uh, has not, not the same ring as the future former future Dr. Brown, but I like Dr. C. Brown. Uh, I also want to thank the board for moving the consent calendar and not sandwiching this presentation between the amazing students and the outcome that they were seeking. Um, they're probably the best example of, of data we can give is really looking at what our students are capable of and we know how successful those, those young men and women are going to be when they move on from our, our uh, buildings. Just to orient you to what we're going to talk about a little bit this evening, we're going to talk briefly about iReady data um, very much a, a whole system view, uh, specifically focused on grades K through 8, uh, kind of giving you some summary data that will really lead in as sort of our benchmarks from which we move forward here as we move throughout the year and look at 
data that we get from the same as well as other metrics at different points of the year. And then we're going to talk briefly about SEL, and I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Lund and Dr. Simon to, to really give some, some more narrative to that data and, and the kinds of things that work that's being done that's leading to the results that we're seeing. So um, last year, as you well know, it was our first year implementing iReady. And, and like any first year pilot, we had some, some growing pains, which is why we will focus on K8 data. We had a really strong K8 implementation. Um, and really, about 40,000 students participated in the, in the iReady diagnostics throughout the course of the year. So they took the first diagnostic in October, the second one in February, and then they finished the school year taking the third one either in late May or early June, depending on which school site they were at. Um, when we look overall, there, there's really some stuff to celebrate in what happened in our district last year, in the, in the year coming out of the pandemic and all of that, that, that entailed. When we started the year um, in October, we had about 27% of our grades one through five students at grade level. When we finished the year, we were over 50. So we had a 23% increase in the number of students who are on grade level between the start of the year and the end of the year. That's tremendous work by our staffs and our teachers and our, and our students. Um, in, in grades six through eight, the jump wasn't quite so large, but it actually was a jump. We saw, again, more students leaving the school year on grade level than we saw entering the school year. And that's kudos to the teams that did a lot of work to make that happen. And that, that was true in both uh, reading, and then more so, if we move to slide four, more so in math. So the growth that we saw in math across the system was quite a bit larger. So in, in grades one through five, there was 34% more students on grade level at the end of the year than there was at the beginning of the year. Um, so that means not, not just kids who were already on grade level stayed on grade level. This is 34% of kids who were not on grade level, who were behind, who are now on grade level leaving the year. All right, um, so you know, in a year where everyone just did the same, everyone would have stayed where they are. So this shows, and we talked last year a lot about acceleration, not remediation. This shows that for a lot of our students, we were able to accelerate them and take them from being behind where they were supposed to be to being where they are supposed to be as they get ready to start this next school year. Uh, and then for grades six through eight, it was a 15 percent growth uh, in the number of students on grade level. So again, we we did see a lot of acceleration, and and that was my statement last year: acceleration, not remediation. That's not going anywhere. You'll hear that from me probably a few hundred times between now and June. But I got a new one that you'll hear a lot too. Um, we'll get to in a, in a few minutes. Um, growth happened at all grade levels between October and February, February and June, um, in both reading and math. So we we saw an increase in the percent of students everywhere, which means we had success in every grade level one through eight. Um, kinder, we didn't give them the test in October. It's a lot for a kinder student to try and learn that as they come in. So we didn't look at kinder growth October through June because it just didn't seem appropriate for those students. Um, nor will we in this upcoming year, by the way. So we'll continue to look uh, one through eight. So the other thing I talked a lot about last year was growth, not placement. So the data I just showed you was change in placements, right? So where is a kid right now at the moment that we test them? Are they on grade level? Are they above grade level? Are they one or two levels behind? Um, and then what does that mean for the supports we have to provide the student? But the other thing that iReady allowed us to look at, one of the reasons we wanted to use iReady last year, is it allows us to look at growth through the year. And so if you'll recall, once every student tested in October, they were given a typical growth goal, right? The growth goal that was their way to maintain, to earn a year of growth with the ex, uh, expectation that students who were not at grade level, their growth goals were bigger so that they would eventually catch up to being on grade level, right? That's that whole second part of goal one, that students below grade level will uh, achieve more than a year of growth. And, and the iReady scale is built to do that. So the next few slides, we're going to talk about how many students achieved their growth goal, 100% of their growth goal. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about medians and not averages. So if I say average, I'm misspeaking. I mean the me median. And the reason we do that is we had kids, um, like in every system, who had huge numbers of growth or not on both ends, and they really shift the average. And they don't tell us, as a district, sort of what's the, the normal that's happening in, an, in a group. So when we have an N size of 40,000, we can look at the median. The median represents really that 50% did, 
did more than what the median of 50% did less. So it really tells us what's the middle of that group performing at, and it gives us a, a place to start looking for positive outliers and areas to provide more support um, when we dig in. So when we look across the system in reading, you see that for many of our grade levels, the median in both meeting, uh, reading and math was over 100%. That means the 50th percentile student achieved or exceeded all of their growth goal for the year, whether that be to stay on or catch up. Um, for grade one, it was 96, so slightly lower. Um, and then in grades six, seven, and eight, there was a, a little bit of a discrepancy compared to grades one through five. So grades, our middle school students showed growth, but their growth rate was not enough to meet their goal on the median. There was a lot of students that did meet their goal, um, but the median was not. And then in math, you'll see that the pattern is much the same, except for um, kudos to middle school. And we talked a lot about sixth grade math last year, but, but here's another indicator that some of the work being done in sixth grade math really impacted students. The median in sixth grade math was 100% of their growth goal. So that was the 50th kid, which means 50% of them did more than 100% of their growth goal for the year um, in sixth grade math. So, so kudos to the sixth grade math teams and the work that Dr. Lund has done with those teams. This is sort of whole district view. I spent time with my team today with both the elementary school principals and the middle school principals digging into their site and looking at all the groups at their site and all the teachers at their site to see where are our positive outliers? Where do we see better than this happening and how can we replicate that throughout the district? And that was the, the question that the principal started grappling with today. And then of course, the flip side of that is, and where do we need to provide support? Are there groups at our schools that need more out of us as, as uh, educators to be able to reach the same growth goal that everyone else is reaching. So, so you see the whole picture district-wide, but today principals got all the way down to the classroom level and looking at how this looked for each teacher. And of course, as Dr. Baker said earlier, we're always going to break things down by our significant special subpopulations and our race and ethnicity groups. So what you'll see um, is that the overall growth in elementary for reading was 105 percent and you'll look at some of the subgroups had higher than 105 percent as their median and some had lower than 100 or 100 percent 105 percent as their median so for example our, our black students their median growth goal was 94 percent of their target uh, where our filipino students were 130 percent of their target for their median growth goal um, so we still have some gaps to work on there's still some areas for exploration here for us to figure out how to provide more support when you move to middle school, you see similar patterns but with much larger swings. So the gaps are larger um, between the highest performing, the, fat, the highest growing subgroups and the lowest growing subgroups in middle school. So again, an area for us to then dive into and go, where do we see groups that follow this pattern and where do we see groups that didn't follow this pattern? Where are there our highlights and what's going on there that we can replicate throughout the system? And you see very similar patterns, although the gaps in math are narrower than they were in reading um, amongst all the subgroups. So similar pattern between elementary and middle school, but narrower gaps even in middle school for math. So again, kudos to the math work that was done this year. Um, this is actually, to be honest, not a predicted result that I would have had. Historically speaking, we would have seen bigger gaps in math. So we do know that there was a lot of attention paid to math work last year um, at all levels, and, and it, it bore fruit. There was an uh, increase in student growth in math beyond what we traditionally have gotten year over year, sort of pre-pandemic. And so when we look at this data, like I said, we're working with principals to explore them, but there's some next steps for the research side of the house as well so that we can support the principals and we can support the sites. Um, we're going to really start digging into the gap data and finding out where were the gaps larger and or smaller so we can help the level offices uh, identify those practices that seem to be most promising for our students. Uh, we're going to work directly with sites. So one of the things we've offered to all the principals is one-on-one -on -one time with research staff members to go through their data, run any statistical analysis they want, and really try and explore deeply what they had last year so that as they set their goals and their programs for this year, we can help them set up monitoring tools to run through the year so they don't wait till the end of the year to see what's going on, but we can do check-ins with them periodically throughout the year. Uh, aligned to the calendar, so they all did see the calendar. They're all aware of the data that's being looked at, and so they're mapping what they're working on as well off of that. Um, the other thing that you're gonna hear a lot from me is leading versus lagging indicators. So 
all of this outcome data is lagging indicators. This is what happened last year, right? But really, if we're going to make big swings at change, we have to find out what's happening right now so that we can make adjustments right now. So we're going to do a lot more work, hopefully, around leading indicators. So Dr. Baker referenced the quality core implementation. And if you look at your um, goals, there's some data sources there that we're going to be working on developing uh, with our colleagues and with teachers and with principals to try and get leading indicator, like what's happening in classrooms, going to visit, going to see. We've actually hired an additional staff member in research whose whole focus is really on street data and teacher focus groups and student focus groups and trying to find out exactly what's happening in classrooms so we can try and correlate that to then the lagging outcome data, which means we can make more proactive changes. So you'll hear leading and lagging from me a lot this year. That's my new acceleration, not remediation uh, refrain that you're going to hear from me. Um, and then the other thing we're going to look is look for confounding factors. So one of the things we've noticed is oftentimes there's other pieces of data that, that have exacerbated the growth or lack of growth that we see. And so it's trying to look at is there something else going on in these pockets where there was high success or not to see if we can figure out how to mitigate those other confounding factors. So that's the, the kind of work research is going to be doing this year uh, to work on that. So that is the kind of quick district overview for iReady and growth. Um, so we let's, can let's do a little pause, pause yep, and process. Say, yep. That was a lot to think about. I know you all have had this ahead of time and yep. you've looked at it. So just take an opportunity to ask questions or to share anything that you're wondering or just what you, what you see in front of you. Colleagues, questions? Ms. Craighead. Um, yes. So Dr. C. Brown, <laughs> um, you, you mentioned lagging and, and leading, but there was another phrase that you used uh, street data. Yes. If you could let us know what exactly you mean by that. Sure. Um, so s street data is actually a term that's gaining in popularity, and I think there's a, a book actually that my team is reading right now called Street Data, and, and I believe the author presented, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, at a recent uh, equity leadership development uh, meeting for our leaders in our district. The idea is that street data is data about what's actually happening with the group that you're under it's under study. So it's one thing for us to sit removed from students and just look at their outcomes. It's a whole other thing to actually go and talk to students about their experience that's leading to that outcome. Like in other words, to get down on the street with the group that's being studied and understand what's going on and gather that data, which paints a much fuller and more robust picture, um, especially as you try and make changes. Because to ask for outcomes to change, but to never look at, is there a change in implementation of instruction? Is there a change in the student experience? But to not explore that, you don't know, right? So it's the, what's that definition of insanity to expect different outcomes without doing anything differently? So that's what that street data is. It's getting down and actually looking at the experience that's happening. So you're talking about looking at students not as numbers or not as just their ad outcomes, but more of them individually, more of them as a person. And, and teachers as well, right? So not just looking and at teachers, teachers' classrooms yeah. as you got this outcome or that outcome, but going in and what's going on and, and how can we support you or how can we take what you're doing that's so amazing and spread it around. But we have to know what that is, which means we have to go see it and talk yeah. about it and help the teacher define it for us. Yeah. And just um, lastly, I would, I would agree with the assessment that the, um, the overall outcomes are surprising in that usually the math numbers are... Um, you know, lagging behind reading. And, and it seems almost um, counterintuitive because when you're accelerating a student in math, um, you might not be spending as much time on those uh, foundational types of math. I don't know how to best describe it, but, but it just seems to me that accelerating in math would, would, um, would show less of um, the uh, improvement over reading. I don't know. I think that's what we've seen historically is more of an improvement in reading. And so I thought that the, um, the numbers were surprising as well, in a good way, in a very good way. Yep. Mr. Miller. Well, first off, that was a lot, so thank you for, <laughs> for taking the break. But it was all good stuff, man. I, I, it's just, um, I think the exact information that all of us have been looking for in regards to uh, not only 
the information about what's happening uh, on a daily basis in our classrooms, but really the information that truly holds all of us accountable to our ultimate goal. Uh, all things considered, it is how we use this data, right? This is part of the reason um, uh, we're having this conversation. And the first two, I guess, breakouts of how we would use the data made pretty good sense to me. I still am trying to wrap my head around how are you going to use that confounding data, those misnomers. I don't know how they're going to provide much mm -hmm. practicality to you. So can you explain to me, like, what what... Sure, sure. Um, so I'll give you an example that, that's kind of borne out sort of across the country. So, so oftentimes, you'll see groups of students that have lower than average achievement. And, and it'd be interesting if you only looked at it in terms of academic success and you only thought about it in terms of what's happening in the classroom. But often there's a, a, another factor. So sometimes that factor might be poor attendance. So poor attendance is a factor that's leading to poor academic achievement that has nothing to do with instructional practices in the classroom, students' engagement, students' attention, or anything else, right? So, so that's a confounding factor that's been discovered, which allows you to take steps to improve the student's attendance, figure out how you can support the student getting to school, which would then lead to an academic achievement increase without changing instructional practice. So sometimes it's about instruction, sometimes it's about what's going on outside the school, but sometimes it's about something else, and if we can find what those things are for groups of students, we can take action to, to try and rectify those situations as well, as much as in our power, to then increase the, stu the student's academic achievement. Mr. Otto, any questions? Um, not so much a, a question, but first an observation and then uh, maybe two observations. Um, you know, we, we, it, it, we live in a different world than we lived in just a few years ago. Everything is expected more quickly. Uh, we want to. We have to to, to make changes uh, based on information that we couldn't even get a long time ago. And I think that in the last year, uh, before we started using this iReady system, uh, we would take tests in April and get the results in uh, September. And uh, the planning had pretty much gone on, and it was pretty difficult to to change it around. But that was okay because. Uh, we were continuing to look at it, but all of a sudden, we're getting data immediately, and I mean, I think the world is kind of like this. Uh, uh, we, exp you know, when, when I order something on Amazon and they say they're sending it right away and it arrives two days later, I'm mad because it's two days, not one day, and uh, uh, and it's become an expectation. But the the revelation about this work to me right now today is where we were a year ago and where we are now. We are planning in real time for what's going on right now with the ability to, uh, I'll use the modern word pivot, uh, to say how can we do this? When you talk about street data, uh, yeah, I mean, you, we, what is this? Let's go find out. You can go find out. I mean, you, it, it may not be perfect, but uh, we're just living at a at a better pace. Uh, the that's the overarching observation. the The point is that um, I just am so impressed coming out of this pandemic, where this district is, that uh, people are coming back. Uh, they're trying to figure out, and we we have a lot of trust in this district, but. They're trying to figure out what's happening next. And I think what we saw right now is where we're going. And what it creates is something that is more difficult to measure, but very, very important for the business that we're all in, and that is the development and maintenance of trust. And I think with this approach that what we're able to do is to say to our, our students, to our teachers, to their parents, uh, we're doing everything we possibly can to deliver on the things that we say that we're going to do. And look, here are the goals that we're looking for. And uh, we're not perfect, but, um, but you can see the effort that we're making to be successful. And uh, it's, it's a sea change uh, in the way it gets done. And what, by the way, I don't know uh, how many other districts are doing this, but I don't think that many. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not unique, but um, 
we're communicating to the public in very tough times when people are saying, I don't know what to think. I think I'll send my kids someplace else. Or, uh, but not in Long Beach. In Long Beach, people are coming back. We've got a school district that's going to open in two weeks. Uh, the, the signs that I have are that people want to come back to Long Beach, and it's because of this. So. Ms. Craig Ed. <clears throat> um, yes. So, Dr. C. Brown, um, you mentioned uh, delivering news to the principals and drilling down to classroom mm -hmm. um, uh, for student outcomes. So, can you talk a little bit about supports for the teachers? Because if you're drilling down to classrooms and you know maybe which teachers need supports and is, is this a, an appropriate time to talk about that or is would this be appropriate with with this report um so i would say that generally this is an appropriate time i'm probably not the appropriate person to answer that question so so i'm hoping actually as we move through the year that that this report that you've got is probably the last time you'll hear from me alone um, Kind of from here on forward, including the one we're about to go into momentarily, you'll hear from me as well as the teams that are doing the work with the teachers. So in, in the research office, we help provide all the data so they can look at it. We provide with training on the skills to look at it. We help answer questions that maybe we didn't think of that they want to know. But when it comes to who's supporting the teachers and who's working with the teachers, that's the principals. And so then I would always defer to my colleagues who supervise the principals, Dr. Camarino, Dr. Lund, and, and Mr. Moskovitz and their directors. So I will let them answer that. I would say that as this is super early and the principals just saw this hours ago, we're probably not there yet. Uh, okay. We will be well, then, shortly. I appreciate that answer. And what I would say, because we probably don't have we probably don't have um, other answers for that. If you could keep that in mind for future um, meetings, for future reports, that, that would be, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be interesting for us to know because I know that a lot of the materials that we've received for this meeting um, refer to support for teachers. And so it'd be very interesting to learn what supports are available and how that works. And I understand that's um, maybe too soon to be talking about that now, and, and, and I accept that, so maybe keep that in the back of your mind for future meetings. Well, with that in mind, three things come to mind um, right off the bat. The first would be in support of our new teachers and our, obviously, collaboration with OCIPD and our BITSA program. Uh, when teachers start to analyze their own data and that connection to their coaching work with their BITSA coach in support of effective practice and implementation. The second would be our site level work in relation to analysis within teams and that sort of public sharing within those teams, grade level teams, department level teams around what's working, what's not working, what are we seeing in the data themselves, who's improving, who's not, and how do we address it. And the third would be from a system standpoint around what we call high leverage team actions. So part of that is that data analysis that teams do. But the other piece of it is really connected to instructional practice. And this was something that we were not able to leverage much last year um, just because of the attention that was focused on our safety responses to the pandemic and really some of our struggles um, with substitutes to be able to release teachers to do that work. So we're looking forward to this year and really reconnecting with some of those high leverage team actions, which includes unit study, lesson study, peer observation, peer coaching, and getting teachers into each other's classrooms to really discuss best practice. It, so it sounds like it's a collaborative effort and it sounds like there's a lot of support there and that's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, so, and the, the fourth I would say at both the elementary, middle and K-8 level is really leveraging our IICs, our instruction and intervention coaches, coordinators, to really support teachers that, that really need that differentiated support. W one of the ways that the budget is impacted by this positive or that impacts what we're talking about is on Monday before school starts almost all schools will have a professional development day in addition to the day before school starts that is funded out of our um, ARP funds that allows them to bring their entire team their entire school teams together 
to look at the kinds of data that you're looking at today. So just to get really specific, um, the research department provided reports. They were at, as Chris mentioned, they were at the middle school and the elementary principals meeting today, tomorrow at the high school principals meeting, guiding in the things that could be good tools for that professional development day. The purpose of that day is to look at data, to look at the connection of the data to quality core instruction, and to have an opportunity before the school year starts and everything is happening at rapid pace for them to bring their teams together led by the principal. Um, and so great opportunity if you want to see what it actually looks like in action to hear teams talking about this data. Most schools, and you'd want to check with the principal, but most schools on the Monday before school starts, the 29th, will have a professional development day that you all have authorized additional funding for, for them to meet. Okay. And one last thing, and this might tee up the next part of the conversation. Um, I look at all of this and I'm grateful and I think it's important to know that everybody's looking at this up and down from our desk down to classrooms um, and support staff. Um, I'm super worried about our middle school kiddos. And we know that that age group really did bear the brunt of um, the pandemic and social growth and social emotional growth and needing support at a really critical age. And I think the last set of data we had uh, had some indicators. I'm super excited about the math. Again, that's kind of upside down from, from anything that I've seen in my eight years. So um, that's really encouraging. Uh, but just you know, to put a pin in how we continue to support um, the people supporting them, so in the classroom and other places on campus, as they continue on their journey, because I don't think um, we would love for them to be able to catch up in middle school. We just know that's a really challenging time. I know Dr. Len, you're going to talk to us a little bit, and Dr. Simon tonight, um, but I did just want to put in that I'm, you know, I'm worried about our middle school kiddos and, and how that's reflected um, in terms of the impact of the last couple of years on that particular grade level. So I think we're ready for part two. Yeah, you you teed it up perfectly, actually. Um, so uh, I, I was just going to give a, a just a kind of a brief highlight of the Pulse survey. So um, in your board packet last week, you were given an executive summary of the Pulse survey. Um, so historically, or, or let me back up. The district outcome goal two is around identity, agency, and belonging, right? And these are what actually I would call leading indicators, right? So belonging and identity and agency are things that can lead to increased student achievement, increased academic outcomes. So these are another area we can look at. Historically, we've given one survey once a year in March to look at these things. And, and we do know that student responses in March are really about what's happened in late February and not necessarily the entirety of the year. So uh, at the end of last year, we implemented a pulse survey in June. We will implement that pulse survey three times so that we have four measures this year of these indicators for identity, agency, and belonging, the fall, the winter, uh, early spring, and late spring. So we will have uh, sort of a, a longitudinal data we can look at. But we do know that, that focusing, like you said, uh, Ms. Kerr, on belonging and agency and identity really supports student uh, outcomes. So a, a few things to, that are noteworthy of taking away is um, between February and June, the number of students who, who reported positive responses to feeling close to other members of the school went up 18%. So there was work being done on the campuses and you're seeing some positive outcomes in these leading indicators around identity and agency and belonging. Um, for the, the question was asked, are you happy to be a part of the school? And the in increase in positive responses between February or March and June was 22%. So there's 22% more students who positively responded to that. And it was about 16,000 students who responded to the poll survey. Um, so it's a, a good size sample for us to take some meaning from. Um, they mentioned things like clubs and the relationships with staffs as the things that really get them belonging. Um, Street data, we saw a great example of agency here just a few minutes ago. And in fact, agency and identity have really positive responses in our system. Um, generally near or above 80% of our students report positively um, having a sense of their own identity and a sense of agency. Slightly lower for belonging um, in the, the low 70s to upper 60% positive. So still, the majority of our students feel positive that they belong to their schools. but. Uh, it's an area where we can provide some growth, right? It's an area we can focus moving forward. So that's sort of the high-level picture of the Pulse Survey, and as we give it out again in September and, and uh, December and February, we'll bring more data back with where they're going. But this is an example where we can co-present, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Len and Dr. Simon to talk more specifically about the things that we're doing 
uh, regarding this? First of all, thank you for this opportunity to uplift our work at the middle and Kate level um, in support of this new goal that we set as a district around belonging, agency, and identity. I'm going to be sharing tonight's presentation with Dr. Simon and her team uh, to lift up our work with the wellness centers, as well as uh, our esteemed principal from Washington, Dr. Rashawn Williams, who is here with us as well, uh, to really give you a, a case study example around some of our work with our new web program, which I'll elaborate upon. So this new uh, this district goal that was set last year, is, it was a new goal around identity, agency, and belonging. We've long assessed um, or surveyed our students around a sense of belonging. That was part of our core survey for a number of years. But these aspects around identity and agency were new, um, new aspects of that work. And I would, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about three efforts that we're making at the middle and Kate level to, uh, to address the, this particular goal. The first was really to build a common understanding around these new terms. Um, what do we mean by student agency? What do we mean by student identity? And to really deepen our understanding of student belonging. And uh, you may have heard us refer to our work um, using QUITS, quality improvement teams, to do that work. And this is something that we leveraged with our principals, uh, which basically means that we assigned principals to, to learn about this new topic and to teach each other. So we created teams around this work, a student identity team, a student agency team, and a student belonging team, tasked with the responsibility of really lifting up what does this new term mean how is it going to be surveyed uh, for our students? And what is the connection to our own practice as leaders and our own practice in the classroom with students? So that's, that's one piece I'm gonna to speak to. The second is in relation to the web program, which has been used at select middle school and K-8 sites across our system for a number of years that we expanded um, district-wide. And WEB is a program that is um, from the same agency that provides our linked crew experience at the high school. So it's really an effort to really create some greater coherence within our system around um, an opportunity to leverage student agency as well as increase student belonging. And Dr. Williams will, will talk specifically about what she's organized her and her team um, through the web experience, going to a conference, training her team, bringing that back to her school site and planning the event, which is uh, scheduled for next week. And then finally, um, really uplifting uh, an exciting new program that we're rolling out with the Office of School Support Services um, to re replicate what we've learned from our high school wellness center experience and really expand that into our middle and K-8 schools that we're really, like I said, really excited about. So first, in terms of our quality improvement teams, this is really leveraging the, the premise that principals are lead learners. Together with teachers, they sit side by side with teachers to really learn about effective practice and then becoming facilitators for each other so that we can, um, that the answers can be in the room, if you will, so that principals can learn from each other around this new work. So we created three quality improvement teams around these three areas. And um, they basically put together presentations for their fellow principals to teach them about this particular topic and then to uplift strategies that they could use as leaders um, with their teachers to build student identity, to build student agency, and to build students' sense of belonging. So in the spring, our principals developed this content and then presented to each other over, over a series of principal meetings, starting first with student identity. The graphics here are really intended to just say these are some things that they uplifted within uh, their trainings and to really help us understand what student identity truly meant that it goes well beyond some of the names that we put on student groups and to really say how does this impact our classrooms what is identity's relationship to intersectionality and how we define ourselves as individuals how does that translate into um, students understanding of a journey of identity so our identities actually tend to change. There are some aspects of our identity that may stay constant, but other aspects of our identity that actually evolve as we grow. 
and evolve as we learn and, and enter um, new forms of identity. You could say students' understanding of their own gender identity, sexual identity, and how that might shift. Um, so identity as fluid indicators. And really um, understanding the role of power and privilege, understanding our systems of oppression as it relates to identity, and how we, um, as a system, as an education system, can support students and their own understanding of their identity, and leveraging that in building community in classrooms. So there's definitely a connection between identity, agency, and belonging. The more you uplift identity, the more connection you build, community you build, and sense of belonging you build. And as students feel a stronger sense of identity, it translates into a stronger sense of agency. So th these pieces do work together, and that was part of our own growth and understanding. Um, looking at how we create identity-safe classrooms for our students, so it's supporting of different identities, but also identity-centered classrooms. We've long talked about student-centered classrooms and what that means when you have you know, students engaged in work and you uh, build in opportunities for students to lead work within classrooms, to present to each other. But then there's also that identity-centered classroom that lifts up different perspectives, um, lifts up different, um, from a curriculum standpoint, different um, content that really allows students to see themselves in the curriculum. Um, what we might call the, the mirrors, windows, and sliding doors of curriculum and how that um, connects to students' roles. So our first quit presented on student identity. Our second addressed student agency. Um, and what does that mean for, from a curriculum standpoint, from a, an instructional standpoint around student empowerment, and really unpacking this understanding around a continuum of voice and how we leverage voice and student voice in, in classrooms, and then choice in classrooms. So you see two continuums here that really outlined um, in real concrete ways what student voice might look like in a classroom and how that could grow from expression of students basically speaking in a classroom to leadership within a classroom. And then from a choice standpoint, from just being a participant to being a designer and entrepreneur of their own curriculum. And what does that look like when you create those opportunities for students? And le really leveraging those strategies both in and outside of the classroom. So part of our work is really, how do we lift up, create new cultures in classrooms, as well as creating new cultures in schools? We don't want our students, and this goes to our restorative work as well, you can't create a restorative culture in a classroom and then have students step into a school that's not restorative. So how do we do work at the classroom level as well as at the system level uh, within our schools? And then finally, around student sense of belonging. And we, like I said, we've talked about student sense of belonging for a while um, and how we uplift that within our schools. Um, pulling in the equity piece as it relates to belonging, as well as the relationship piece. I think this is leveraged greatly by our work with restorative practices, uh, which we'll build into a future presentation for you as well, so you can get a sense of where we are with our restorative work. But then also uplifting the role of parents as it relates to belonging, which I will say at the middle school level is especially challenging. Um, historically, parents come from elementary where there's a strong connection to our schools. Um, there's often more involvement directly in our schools. You have six years at an elementary school and then you step into a middle school where you have three years of experience. And part of our reframing of that work is you may have three years with this one particular student, but you don't have three years with the family. You often have multiple years with the family who have multiple children go through your system. So it's really a rethinking about the relationship that you have with parents is not in relation to that just that one child, but it's in relation to all their children. And you may actually have this same family for eight years. So you may think you only have three years to build this relationship where you may actually have eight. So um, really changing our schools from what you see on the left in the diagram, which you might call a fortress scenario of <laughs> keeping parents outside the school to really more of a partnership relationship. Um, and what that might look like at a middle school where, like I said, that relationship um, is you're transitioning between levels and the role that parents play in that transition. And how do we uplift that partnership that um, parents do play a role in really helping them to define that role um, and feel like they have a place in a middle school world in that partnership. 
So this was just part of our collective learning that we did together to really uplift um, these three areas in relation to a goal, to give us, a, one, a deeper understanding of the goal itself, and then, two, to really help us work towards that um, increasing student's sense of identity, belonging, and agency in relation to that goal. Our web work is one key aspect of this. And like I said, this was something, a program that was used in three, four of our middle and K-8 schools with consistency over the years and expanding to all 22 schools this year. So I'm going to invite up Dr. Rashawn Williams to talk specifically about our web program that, like I said, connects to our linked crew program at the high school. Uh, and she'll talk specifically about the strategies that she's thinking about at Washington to uplift student agency, student identity, and student belonging in relation to our web work. So thank you, Dr. Williams, for being with us tonight. Hello, all. Thank you all for having me. I am delighted to be here to all of you, the board members, and to the senior team. If there was a day to be at the board meeting, today was that day. So, so excited to see those students really demonstrate uh, student agency. Um, I stand here alone, but I stand here really on the shoulders of my team. Uh, thank them, thanking them so much. I'm sure they're watching uh, for their continued support, for their work on the slides. Uh, Michelle Gallagher, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, thank you, Portia Smith, thank you all so very much. All right, Webb at Washington, thank you to all who had a hand in allowing our middle schools to attend. Uh, it was, a, I think, a week-long, maybe three- or four-day event around Irvine. Very, very long days. Um, we thought we were just going to, you know, have some fun and hang out with some people, but they really did put us to work. They gave us the mentality of what Web is all about, the idea about bringing, uh, really increasing student self-belonging, students' sense of belonging, um, and they also, throughout their activities, allowed us to grow closer to each other. So as we began to go closer to each other, uh, then we got a love and a feel for what we all can do. And then we were excited to then pass that on to our teams. So at Washington, uh, we have what we're calling a, a layered system. We are now the Washington Wolves, and so our sixth graders, they start as Washington Pups. Uh, our seventh graders are the Wolves, and then our eighth graders are the PAC leaders. And so we're really trying to increase really that uh, student agency. We're giving our eighth graders really an opportunity to demonstrate themselves as leaders. Um, we're referring to them as PAC leaders, and then we're hoping that they live up to that expectation. At the same time, uh, we're introducing them, our sixth and seventh graders, to them um, as their PAC leader. So we're hoping that has some some weight on it. So uh, in the first slide, we have our team, our, our team of teachers. So uh, three teachers went with us to the web training, and then they were tasked with the task of then coming back and then training, uh, experiencing, sharing their experience with our teachers, and then training seventh graders, last year's seventh graders, to be this year's um, eighth grade web leaders. So they worked tirelessly, tirelessly Ms. Salgado, uh, Mr. Fuentes, and Mr. Murillo um, are still working over the summer just to make sure that the orientation will be a success. Uh, so the web, apologize for just reading it, it's a program where we have um, eight to ten sixth graders, our incoming sixth graders, coming on campus, and they will be paired with two eighth graders. And these eighth graders will lead them through team building opportunities, opportunities to get to know each other, so that as they walk on the campus, they have at least one somebody that they can say hi to, and it's an eighth grader, and so, you know, it's like, oh, I know an eighth grader, like, I'm big and bad, whoop, whoop. Um, and so the web leaders, they meet the, so when we come, we'll do our web training on actually the 29th and the 30th. The web leaders will then meet their sixth graders uh, during the sixth grade orientation, and then they'll walk them through uh, the games and, and their, their games because we want our students to know that it's okay to play. Our middle school students are 10, 11, 12th grade, 10, 10, 11, 12 years old, 11, 12, 13, and we want them to know the power of play. And so, yes, it's play, and we expect them to have some great fun, but while they're playing, they're also building relationships. 
And so the web leaders will um, invite them to play and then also give them a tour, a real tour of the campus. The real deal on this teacher, the real deal on where to go, the real deal on where to get, get in line first so that you can get the pizza because the pizza is the good line. Um, and so we expect them to do all of that. And so in the process of that, then there, we're increasing their sense of belonging because if I feel like I belong, then I, though I don't feel like getting up early in the morning, I'll make an extra effort to do so because I know I'll see my friend when I get there. If I don't think I belong and it's 630 and now it's starting to be seven and now school starts at eight, I don't know if I really want to make that effort, extra effort to get there if I don't have someone to say hi to when I do. Um, we work with them building student agency because our web leaders, they play an important role in ensuring that that's a positive sixth grade transition uh, from middle school to make them feel important, to make them feel like they uh, belong. And so where everybody belongs, we provide a way for our wolf pups to find their place. Uh, the picture in the front, the first picture is, is our team. We presented this uh, web to our staff and we had them go through the process, play some games with them during that staff meeting. And then that's our second picture is our web uh, coordinators teaching and playing, no, just really playing with our future web leaders. Um, showing them the process and then that's one of the activities um, in the third picture and then the fourth picture is just how we really tried to welcome our staff. We had music, we had balloons, we had the uh, balloons and the bubble guns going up and it was really a fun, a fun experience. And then we wanted to include this as well. So we have our web orientation, but at the same time we have our web orientation. You know our, our sixth grade parents, they're nervous, they're going to bring their children to this web orientation and their expectations that they're going to be hip to hip with their child. Nope, that's not the case. So instead, uh, we have on the blacktop, we have about 15 of our community organizations that will set up, set up booths on the blacktop so that as our parents are dropping off with the expectation of staying with their sixth grader, uh, we're going to invite them over to our community fair. And because what we understand is that if our students know that we have a, sp a space for their parents, then they're most likely to feel a sense of belonging as well. Believe it or not, we have a lot of students who are still, or whose parents are walking them to school every single day. They give them a hug, they give them a blessing, they send them into the gate. And those students are proudly hugging their parents. And we want those students to know that yes, we want your parents here. Yes, come join us, yes. Is, if we create a sense of belonging with our parents, we believe that that will trickle down and our students will receive that as well. So we do have, during our orientation, while our students, our sixth graders are learning the campus, uh, we have another part of the campus is open. We have the Kona food truck coming. Uh, a comp uh, community organization donated about 350 backpacks. So we'll be able to give uh, the backpacks to our families in addition to selling our spirit wear and other community organizations that will be on campus. So that's one of the areas in which we are working really, really hard at Washington Middle School to really increase student agency and really increase student sense of belonging because if they feel like they belong, then they're more likely to show up. And when they show up, we have phenomenal teachers who are there and ready to deliver some great instruction. Well, did I invite the right principal or what? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Williams did an amazing job Thank sharing you. about your web program. Thank, Thank you. you so much. To you and your team of uh, teachers um, that really are to make this happen. This doesn't happen by happenstance. This happens with a lot of planning and organization, a lot of preparation, uh, which the board supported us in this work. The LASP calls out our web implementation, the training that they received, the extra hourly we provided, the materials, the t-shirts, the t-shirts that help create that sense of belonging for students is all being provided through uh, board board funding. So thank you for that. Thank you. Do you have any questions for uh, Dr. Williams before uh, she leaves us? Colleagues. <clears throat> I don't have any, <clears throat> thank you. I don't have any questions, but I just want to say that it all sounds wonderful. I, I love hearing that we are, um, we're treating students, um, in a way that is valued, in a way that lets them know they're special, we care about them, not just as um, 
as somebody who can produce something as a, as a product, like, you know, we talk about outcomes and test scores and all that, but that we truly care about our students, how they feel with their sense of belonging, with their um, identity and agency. So it's just wonderful to hear what's happening at Washington. It's wonderful to hear about all the other efforts we're making, the wellness centers at, in, at the middle school level, and it really warms my heart to, to know that <clears throat> our efforts are so much more than academic. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Uh, first off, Dr. Williams, okay. you did an amazing job. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to speak to uh, the intention around the things that are going on at Washington. As in all honesty, I don't have to tell the people in this room who have been doing the um, educational background on how kids in their adolescent years look for something to attach themselves to and people to attach themselves to. So to do something like our pups and our wolves and our packs with intention around positivity um, especially in my, in my neighborhood. I call it my neighborhood because I grew up not too far from there. Um, I really do appreciate that. And so uh, it's webs like we're uh, promoting here um, that in just keeping it all the way funky with you. <laughs> uh, and some of our tougher neighborhoods are gonna be most important. Um, uh, I, I just appreciate that intention. Thank you. When is your sixth grade orientation? Because you might have some people that want to come by. So Please shout do. it out. August 29th and August 30th. And interestingly enough, August 30th is our teacher's first day back. And so we did that with intention as well so that our teachers really could participate and our students will get an opportunity to really see um, some of the teachers and, and, and get that uh, quick relationship with them. Nine to 12. Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I want to compliment you too on your, <clears throat> excuse me, on your presentation. But um, I mean, we we had a the, the superintendent had a goal last year about uh, communications, and uh, I'm calling out Justin right now because this is a message that's got to go out. I mean, this is to see the confidence that uh, that this kind of work can instill not only in students but in teachers and in your and in colleagues throughout the district is that it, uh, it's too good to be missed and it's uh and it's a community that's receptive to it so so thank you um thank you for being with us tonight i love hearing you say that you want your kids to play that in the seriousness of the work, I think we lose that, especially over the last couple of years. Things have been really intense and that you have an intention to be playful with your students and bring that out in them um, is super great to hear. And I will hopefully be stopping by, but thank you for that work and thank you for coming. I think as we talk about student outcomes and we talk about data, um, we get packets that are really intense, even though it's not 72 slides, it's six slides, but it's still really intense. Um, but always to hear how it's um, reflected back in intent on a site, I think gives context, not just for us, uh, but for folks around the community to, to see um, the connectedness of the intent behind the work, which will produce the outcomes. Um, so thank you for being here, and thank you, uh, Dr. Lund, for including that in your presentation. I think it's important. I think you have more to say with us, and Dr. Simon as well, about continuing work. But again, we don't want to focus on outcomes and lose sight of the complexity, those confounding data points, and those intersections that will get us to the place where we want our kids to be. Uh, so thank you. Yes, and thank, thank you, Dr. Williams, thank for you sharing all. your story with us. Just a reminder, WEB stands for where everyone belongs. And I don't want to lose sight of that. The whole intent here is to take all that we know about students and the great diversity and identity that they bring and really create a space where they all feel that they belong. Can right, I, I'll can turn I it over in, to, uh, I'm sorry. I said, can I jump in for a second? Just as a way to kind of correlate things together. So they worked on belonging in between February and June. The sense of belonging at that school went up almost 10%. So there's a direct impact um, of the work that they do. So I just figured since we talked about Washington, we'd share how Washington did on that particular thing. 
All right, I'm going to pass it to uh, Dr. Erin Simon and her team to really talk through really the amazing plans that we have for our middle and K-8 wellness centers. Thank you, and I moved because my neck is a little tight. I want to be able to look square at you, so this is why I'm here. I want to be disrespectful um, in this work. So this good evening to um, our board president, Madam President, um, Megan Kerr, members of the board, Superintendent Baker, um, my senior uh, team members, and the LBUSD community. As always, it is just such a pleasure to be with each of you, and I hope this greeting just finds you in great spirits and also well. So in recognition uh, that social and emotional well-being, wellness, and mental health are essential for school and life success. Our wonderful district, the Long Beach Unified School District, is currently making that shift even more so to a systemic long-term implementation of social emotional learning, wellness, and mental health to create equitable experiences across all schools and to center agency, a sense of belonging, and so many other aspects of the work that we just heard from Dr. Williams and also Dr. Lott. Hence the reason student support services Staff members, Dr. Sosa Bhattarama, who will come to the podium very soon, and Ms. Susanna Cortez, who is our program specialist, alongside Dr. Lunn and his team, the middle school and K-8 offices, um, created the middle school and K-8 wellness centers. So I want to highlight, and sorry to have that on the first slide, just really um, the goal for year one for our middle school wellness centers. Um, I know we talked about the middle school will, wellness centers um, kind of building on the success of our high school wellness centers. Um, just to give you a little snapshot of um, the work that our team um, conducted with the high school wellness centers, and I think just says it all, 65,000 plus students walked into our wellness centers at our high schools. Let's say that one more time, 65,000 students, right? If that doesn't give you tingles, right, excitement, and I don't know, it gives me great joy to say that. So with our work with the wellness centers, the goal is to support students by strengthening student, family, and staff social and emotional skills. Just as the team you know, conducted with our high school wellness centers. They're going to be surveying students, families, and staff to learn about each middle school's current culture and climate and also their social and emotional needs. And most of all, our students will be able to name their wellness center, which also brings a sense of belonging and agency the same way um, that we did with our high school wellness centers. The Division of Student Support Services will provide the foundational framework with the essential services each center will be directed or must provide and will support the team in executing all tasks and interventions of this work. The wellness centers will be a safe and unique space which will nurture the overall health of our students, our families and staff while providing a seamless connection between school and their local community agencies. And now with, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce, right, the, the brain behind this work, um, Dr. Sosa Vadarama, who serves as our Director of Student Support Services. Good evening, uh, board and executive staff and community. I'm so excited to be here and just to hear all of the great things that are happening with our middle schools today and to be able to be a part of that as well. So today we've been actually on a tour um, talking about middle school wellness centers and we're just um, so thrilled that we're able to expand the work that we started last year with 
um, high school wellness centers. And based on the data from our poll surveys that uh, Dr. Chris Brown talked about, um, also surveys that we conducted at the schools, and uh, anecdotal information and, and comments that we got from parents when we were doing uh, you know, parent workshops through parent university and so forth, we knew that something was needed for our middle school wellness. Um, so lucky uh, for us that we were able to expand, expand that this year. And so the vision of the wellness centers is to um, duplicate some of the work that we did with middle schools, but also we are able to really customize some of the, the work that we're gonna be providing based on the developmental needs of those students. We know that those students are pre-adolescents, so they're not quite little kids anymore, but they're also not teenagers yet, so they're in that middle stage, and so a lot of the work that we're gonna be doing is gonna be customized for that. Um, and the work that we're gonna do will include sur service, support services for the students, but it's also super exciting to be able to do work with parents. And so the centers will be also providing services to parents because uh, as we heard, uh, parents are still an important part of students' lives, right? We don't want them to lose their enthusiasm for being involved and engaged in their children's education. Um, after they leave, leave elementary school, so there will be a component also for um, family engagement, um, family support services such as uh, workshops and um, resources and support groups, for example. Um, so we are going to provide a range of resources for students and families, um, but this will be an early intervention and prevention service. It's a center that is supposed to be um, what we call a tier one uh, support, right? It's available to all students. Uh, any student can walk in. They don't have to have a mental health concern. They don't have to have any issue. There's going to be activities for them to participate in to help with that sense of belonging, um, doing community um, service type projects like maybe working on a garden. And those projects will depend on what is interesting for them, what they think is important for their school community. Um, we will be working together with the other programs that are on campus. So whether that's the web, uh, whether there's restorative justice work happening there, we'll you know make sure that we're cognizant of that. If there are any other types of programs or clubs, you know we're going to be working together to coordinate that. Um, and one of the things that you know Susana said today that I thought really captured a lot of the principals who we were talking to was. Yes, we are going to do referrals, we are providing short-term counseling, but we're not just going to write phone numbers on a post-it and give it to a student or a family, because that's, anybody can you know, get that from the internet, right? We're gonna help them um, access those resources. So you know, asking them, do you need help calling? Do you wanna call together? Um, checking in, did that work out for you? Really doing some case management with them to make sure that they're accessing those resources um, if, they're if they're necessary, you know, past the time that they're with, with us. Um, you know, it's also really going to be empowering uh, because we, we know that our students, especially if you had an opportunity, I don't know if you read the whole um, poll survey, more than the executive summary, if you went through all of it, there's some really great information in there and some good insight. And we know that our students um, want help. Sometimes they don't know who to ask for help on campus. And so, yes, we will have the centers. The centers will be open. They can um, come in, they can make a self-referral, a parent can refer, a teacher can refer. Uh, we'll have you know appointments. But we are also gonna have our social workers out in the campus, you know, doing activities in the campus. So if a student is too shy to walk into the center, um, the center will be out in the campus for them also to access the support and find things to do with their peers and make some friends. So we have been busy this summer. Uh, we have already hired the 12 social workers um, for those wellness centers. And so we have 23 uh, middle schools, 21 middle schools. But um, some schools will have a full-time social worker and other schools will, have, will be sharing. So all 12 have been hired. Uh, they will be supervised by our um, 
program specialist, our lead social worker, Susana Cortez, who really is um, a super energetic person, and um, she's been doing a great job with, with high school. She was, you know, she's also supporting our foster youth unit social worker, so she's just a, a really committed and um, awesome individual, so they will be in good hands with her training. We'll provide professional development and supervision to the social workers, but they're on the campuses of the schools, and so it's really important for us to work together with principals, with leadership, with the staff there, to integrate them into that school community. So at a glance, this is our, our we have a project timeline. Um, we've done a lot of these things already, like hiring staff. Uh, we'll be doing some site visits to determine you know, the, the layouts and, and so forth. Um, our goal is to be open and operational by October. So the staff just started yesterday. We have a couple of staff that will be starting a little later. Um, they're going through training. We have um, a peer mentoring curriculum that they will be trained in, um, and they'll be training students uh, to do that. So we will be working on capacity building and integrating them into um, the Long Beach Way and our framework, and our goal is to start um, providing services to students in October. So one of the things that I mentioned was that this was a uh, early intervention and prevention service, and it is not a crisis center. So the wellness centers are there for all students, right? But if a student is having, um, whether it's a mental health crisis or, um, and I'm thinking like a suicide assessment needs to be done, they should not be passed on they will not be passed on from one person to another person to the wellness center, right? That's not our protocol. Um, if a student does disclose anything that's concerning, the social worker is trained to provide that type of support. But it's not going to be that place at the crisis center. We don't want it to be um, a place that students are going to be afraid to be seen in because it's associated as a crisis center. Um, that's not what it is. Um, it's going to um, include a lot of um, other types of support. So we'll have a food pantry where they can have snacks, but we've also um, have some partnerships with some community organizations where if a student or a family wants to take some non-perishable food, we will have that available. We also have uh, toiletries, um, some extra clothes, so there's a lot of resources and those services we've partnered with our Bethune Homeless Education Program to be able to support students that um, go in there and they don't have to fill out a form, they don't have to do anything. You know, there's a closet, they take what they need um, when they need it. And again, the services are confidential um, for the parents, for the students. Um, if we do need to get uh, parental permission because of the student's age, you know, if they're under the age of 12, then we will have consent forms. Um, but, you know, it's a place where they can come in and, and walk in and talk to somebody or maybe not talk to anybody and engage in an activity and get to know. Uh, and we will be there um, the whole day. So here are some of the things that we will be providing. As I mentioned, short-term counseling, uh, family education and family support groups, presentations to teachers um, if they want to know more about. Um, they will also be we'll providing case management, as I mentioned. Um, one of the things Susana mentioned today at the principals meeting was as the social workers are being trained today, some of them already have ideas of things that they want to do. And one of them, you know, one of the ideas that we thought was really good was, well, what if we like once a month have something for um, the staff? Like it could be like, you know, ice cream at the wellness center for staff and it'll be a time for them to really um, build a sense of belonging amongst the staff as well, right, really, so they can model for their, for their students. Oh, that's it. So that was our wellness centers in a nutshell. We're, we're gonna be getting ready to um, work on that. We're working on brochures, 
uh, ways that we're going to promote it on social media and really make sure that our students, staff, and families know about it and know how to access it. And so if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions, colleagues? Mr. Miller. I feel like I've had way too many questions today, so excuse me. But it's been a lot of good stuff, and I'm just curious. Um, first off, I'm really excited about the wellness centers at the uh, middle schools um, uh, because I've seen the success that they've had at the high schools. Now, this is where I'm going to need both you and, and Dr. Lund's expertise here because and, and I think you've already kind of spoke to this, but I'm just curious on how we can continue to keep those spaces successful for our more adolescent youth. So you spoke to the customization of these spaces for our junior high school kids, understanding that they are going to be at a different maturity level than someone in high school. What, I mean, can you speak to just, uh, programmatically what maybe some of those things may look like? Sure, so it really depends on what the community wants. At the beginning of last year when we opened the high school wellness centers, we sent out surveys to students, to parents, and to staff to ask them what things do you wanna see in a wellness center? What do you wanna name your wellness center? Uh, so for example, some of the activities, uh, and we got like 6,500 students um, to respond to the survey, which is not bad. Um, and so one of the schools uh, said that um, their students wanted activities, but not like group activities. They wanted activities that they can engage in with other students, but individually. Other students wanted to do crocheting. Um, some of them wanted to have more of the GSA clubs um, come to that, to that center, the uh, Gay and Straight Student Alliance. Um, others had gardening, um, others had uh, speakers on healthy relationships or vaping. So it just depends on what it is that the um, students, the parents, and the staff want. Um, the other big thing is that every wellness center has a student committee. So the activities are student, not just focused, but led. So the students come together, you know, the, the social worker or the facilitator facilitate that, that discussion, you know, what's working, what's not working, um, and the students decide, you know, so just there was a survey, but they've noticed that a lot of students are interested in something. So they will, I think we had a, a couple of the schools, um, some dogs come for student um, uh, therapy, therapy dogs. They had an organization. We had to ask for all the permissions and all of that, but that was something that they wanted. And so those are some of the customizations um, that we can do. Yeah, Mr. Miller, I would also say that we want to replicate what we've learned from our high school model um, while also differentiating for our younger students. We, we talked about um, the walk-in aspect of our high school model may not work as well at a middle school. So that's a modification that we're looking at of what a referral, self-referral mm -hmm. or teacher referral might look like that might um, create a little bit more organization that might be required for a middle school setting. Yeah. Um, the second might be how do we really incorporate parents more into the role of the wellness center mm -hmm. uh, and really value that relationship that, um, that exists as partners in their learning as well as um, the relationship with our family resource centers. So our, our high schools aren't connected to our family resource centers, generally speaking, but the, while at the middle and K, they are. So really being clear around the role that each of these plays in relation to supporting students and families. Um, perhaps our relationship even with our school-based mental health provider. Um, the role that we've been exploring around what our, our counselor's role, psychologist's role, and social worker's role and where they overlap and where they're different. So those sort of ideas that really help us unpack what this uh, wellness center could, could be for our students. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm okay. Thank you for that. I think the differentiation for middle schools is a really important piece of the work. And something that I'm hearing over and over again tonight is the inclusion and the expectation and the desire to have family and parent engagement in the work on the school site. 
Um, I know there's a lot of talk of community schools and we don't have them per se as defined by some of the external organizations, but this really is the model of wanting to bring folks into the space and allowing and giving resources that we, we may have already had access to, um, but making them aware of them in new ways that um, Dr. Williams spoke to around um, being welcome on the campus and feeling like you don't have to stop at the curb. Um, so I applaud and I'm excited for the work that is intentional around bringing students' families um, or whatever their families may look like. It might be you know, carers or grandparents or other folks in their life who are important, but really opening the doors, which I don't think was necessarily my experience as, as a parent of a middle schooler. I think um, when that was happening, it was a little more like, we got them. We'll call you if you need, we need you. Um, but that idea that we ask them to, to trust us uh, this gives a little more credence to the work that we're trying to do and support them in the work that they're doing in raising uh, their their students. So um, the collaborativeness of it, it's really complicated and comprehensive work that I think we've wanted to do and have the opportunity with um, some of the funding streams to try out what works so that as um, those funding streams may not be as abundant, really trying to incorporate that into future budget cycles and what that would look like. Um, in the long term. So excited to see what comes out of each middle school, because we know our middle school community, especially our bigger ones, are really different communities. Mm -hmm. And so the activities at one might be vastly different, and um, social workers are magical creatures, I know, especially ones, I would say, who want to intentionally work with middle schoolers, especially, um, and looking forward to, to what they bring to the table and the opportunities that they you know, share with us that we may not have thought of before. Uh, yes, Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious. It's really more for Jill and Yumi. Um, are these uh, pandemic monies? Is it? Uh, does it come from federal funds? Does it come from state yeah. funds? Uh, uh, what's the time frame? They're, yeah. they're not, I assume, ongoing. Great question. These are actually funded out of LCFF dollars, state dollars, ongoing funds. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, Mr. Miller. Really small question, just curious. With the social work positions, mm -hmm. BSW, MSW, LCSW? Um, most of them are LCSWs, oh, really? um, or they are ACSWs, which they're working on their oh, hours wow. to get their clinical license. And that's, of course, they have to have a pupil personnel services credential in social work as well. Great, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very exciting that you found 13 to hire, 13 great <laughs> well, ones to hire right now. <laughs> yes. um, Thank you. So I don't know if there's anything else, Dr. Lund and your team. Thank you all for sharing with us. Um, Dr. Baker, do you have anything you wanted to, to say to wrap up before we move on to the next item? Just thank you for exploring student outcomes focused governance tonight. Great questions, great insights, what, and what you've um, prompted our staff to be able to share, I think is just a, a really a really great evening. I also just want to say the data that Claudia shared about, or I, actually I think Aaron shared, 65,000 visits to the high school wellness centers equates to every high school student visiting about three times. Now, I don't, I, I can't say that 100% of our students did, but that is a significant data point to just hold on to, that every student would have visited three times to get to 65,000 visits. So great use. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mr. Otto? Question. Sure, Mr. Otto. Yeah, could, could we have the slides uh, that are being used on the, 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 Absolutely. the presentations? Yes. Uh, there? Yep. I think that will give meaning to it. And then um, can we use some of that one-time money to get bigger screens? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, we are moving on to item 16, administrative assignments. Dr. Baker. Yes, thank you. So tonight I will continue the practice of um, asking our team who have administrative assignments to make the recommendations and announcement of their assignments. So I will turn to Dr. Lund. I have uh, one recommendation for you tonight and it's in support of Avalon K-12. Uh, and expanding the support services that we're providing at Avalon and the creation of a new assistant principal position at Avalon. And the rec recommendation is for 
Gage Bailey to be promoted to that position as of assistant principal at Avalon. Um, Gage comes to us from outside of our system with a number of years of administrative experience at both the elementary and secondary level and will really complement um, the leadership at, at, at Avalon. And to Dr. Simon. Board members, thank you uh, so much. So I, I bring to you four recommendations uh, this evening. Uh, one is a um, new position, a new director position within the Division of Special Education, and that is for uh, Director of Special Education, Teaching and Learning, um, which uh, I bring forth to you the name uh, Luana Wesley, who is currently, uh, who is a program administrator, and we would like to move her to Director of Special Education, uh, Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have Dr. Rachel Heenan, who currently serves as our Director of Special Education in SELPA. Uh, we would like to move her into the role of Director of SELPA, Compliance, and also Data Monitoring. And then we have two new hires uh, to bring to you today uh, for recommendation. That is Amber Murakami, who is a new hire from the Bellflower Unified School District, and she will move into the position of administrative assistant in uh, the Division of Special Education. And then the last name I bring to you today is Dr. Sine Pearson, um, who uh, currently serves in um, school district, uh, Compton, and will be moving into the position of administrative assistant um, within the special education office, um, supporting our collaborative co-teaching at our preschool um, level. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Zaid. And last but not least, Dr. Wendy Rosenquist, moving from Program Administrator Special Education to Program Administrator Human Resource Services. We are excited about her expertise, her skill in joining our classified and certificated uh, investigations. Great, thank you. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 4-0-0. Okay. We're moving on to new business. Uh, item 17.1, Superintendent Contract Renewal and Terms. Ms. Takahashi, I believe. Yes, I, I will read the statement. To um, prior to the board's consideration of the recommended approval for the amendment to the employment agreement for the superintendent, in alignment with SB 1436, which requires orally introducing actions on items impacting the annual compensation of executive staff, this agenda item involves the amendment of the agreement for the superintendent to extend the contract and all dates in the agreement by one year. The amendment does not increase the annual salary, salary schedule, or fringe, benef fringe benefits above the existing employment agreement. Move approval. Second. Motion a second. Discussion. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, when the, the rules around the doing of these uh, contract extensions and whatnot are complicated, but I consider this just a request for us to decide whether we want the superintendent's contract to be renewed, and I wholeheartedly do. Um, I just think that uh, what we've seen today, for example, the work that's going on is uh, amazing. And uh, so I, I uh, support, champion everything that we're doing in this district. So I'm happy to make the motion. Thank you, Mr. Otto. Anyone else? Uh, in the famous words of my friend, Dr. Benitez, ditto. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 4-0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, we removed 17.2. So we are at report of board members. Ms. Craighead, why don't you lead us off? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I've had the opportunity uh, this summer to peek in on a couple of professional development training events like the Equity, Equity Leadership and Talent Development Summer Institute for Teachers and Leaders. That's a mouthful. Uh, 
Um, they were working on things like smarty goals. So you take your smart goal and you add, yeah, yeah, made them smarter with uh, inclusivity and um, equity. Um, and so thanks to Sean Abbott, uh, who is retiring, that was actually the last, I guess her last task for the district. Um, and uh, everybody gave her a very nice send off. And uh, Kelly, Maynard, Jennifer, and everybody else <clears throat> who worked on that event, it was really wonderful to, to see this group that just volunteered to attend this um, leadership event. And then this morning, um, I had an opportunity to attend an event for Head Start, Early Head Start, and Educare. It was the kickoff for the 22-23 school year. Um, so thank you to uh, Lachelle Diggs for the invitation. There was a keynote speaker who spoke about um, dismantling bias and um, encouraging our staff and teachers to see our kids in a different way. <clears throat> so that was wonderful and just occurred to me that excellence and equity is something that's embedded in everything we do at every level. And it's just exciting to see. And then just quickly, I wanted to talk about the um, Sankofa summer program. I attended the kind of like open house event at Madison and I, I was able to witness just the most wonderful, joyous occasion with our um, with our our young black scholars, and they had tables set up around a little uh, grassy area. The kids were wearing glasses that they had made out of Legos, and they chose the Legos specifically. Um, in different colors to represent different things. It could have been representing um, their, uh, their heritage or something they liked or, or whatever it was. And I had the opportunity to talk to so many students. And for those students to take such pride and, <clears throat> and joy in having you know somebody just really connecting with them, and that was such a fabulous event. I, I just can't say enough about it. But I do want to mention that I went to the classroom to see uh, some of the things that were up on the walls. And when I was in the classroom, there was a little boy that came in. And he saw me looking at things that were um, up on display. And he asked if I wanted to see his artwork. So of course, I said yes, because, well, f number one, he was adorable. And number two, I like artwork. So <clears throat> he takes me to a part of the classroom where there's uh, artwork on display. And he showed me the artwork that the teachers had as a reference for the kids. And he said, um, don't you think it looks like a kindergartner did that? But it was an artist. And I said, really? How do you feel about that? Do you think that's good? And this boy looked at me, and he thought about it for a minute. And then he said, I think that's OK, because art isn't perfect. And I thought, wait a minute, how old are you again? I mean, this. <clears throat> Uh, this boy was incredible, and his name is Evan. And then he showed me his artwork. And he had depicted himself as a diamond with a smile, just radiating, just shining, just like a shining gem. He depicted himself as a shining gem. And I just thought that was the most fabulous, inspirational thing. And I believe Evan is somebody I will always remember. So thank you for the invitation to that event. I forget who put out that invitation, but it was just wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Otto, your board report. Yeah, and uh, I, I will be brief. Um, I went to, uh, I can't remember the name of the event last week that uh, all the uh, principals here. The Equity Leadership Talent Development Institute. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And and I stayed for, for quite a while, and it was very moving because uh, everybody's coming back to school, and uh, everybody was sharing with one another what it was that they 
were excited about about coming back to school and uh, and it just reminded me that we're, that's where we are right now we're about to start this uh, uh, this new year and uh, um, uh, so I'm 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 looking forward to it I think we've got a lot of good things going on and uh, uh, it's been a it's been a busy summer uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, everybody's uh, kept their shoulder to the wheel and uh, and uh, worked hard to get a, a good a good send off. That's all I'll say today. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, well, I have a couple of things. Uh, first, I attended the I guess you can call the sunsetting of the uh, Books and Buckets Academy uh, on June thirtieth. I know this uh, all too well because that's the location where I tore my ACL. <laughs> uh, but all things considered, it was a fantastic uh, presentation to celebrate uh, the both uh, academic and athletic accolades of young men between the ages of 12 to, I think, 17. Uh, and so I just wanted to give a big shout out to Books and Buckets for their hard work. Uh, and all of their uh, great young men and young women uh, who went through the program um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a couple of opportunities coming up in my district and throughout the city of Long Beach that I just wanted to make people aware of. Uh, there are two uh, health fairs going on literally at the same time. Uh, on the same date, on August 20th, that I'm partnering with both of them. One, I spoke to, I spoke about both of these last uh, board meeting. One is at Shear Park. Uh, once again, it will be around health and wellness, but it will be also about giving young men haircuts and doing physicals and getting free backpacks and free food. And so, uh, and we'll be doing a, this is going to be in partnership with uh, council member Al Austin. And then there's a second one, very similar uh, in structure that will be going on at MLK Park. And this is in partnership with uh, Dr. Suli Saro and our city prosecutor and Doug Halbert uh, and myself along with uh, a friend of mine from high school named Marcus Hobbs who's been uh, putting this all together for us uh, which I'm very much appreciative uh, but all things considered that's going to be happening at MLK Park uh, like I said that's on uh, August 20th which I have both of those items posted on my Facebook page for those that are interested along with that uh, there is a program being hosted by uh, LBCEI uh, in partnership with a local nonprofit uh, titled Demo Chicks, which is focused around helping young men and young women of color uh, get into uh, STEM careers, predominantly around architecture construction and engineering. So this program will be starting on September 6th, but they are currently doing signups. Once again, for more details, you can go directly to my Facebook page where I've listed the link um, uh, and just click that link and sign up. I think signups end the last day of August, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I think that is all for me, because you're going to be highlighting a couple of things, too, right? Thank you. Mr. Otto, did you have one more? Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's, it's, it's two quick ones. Um, as many of you know, I've been involved with the aquarium for a long time. And um, uh, last week, the, we went to the city council, uh, which we partner with, and changed the relationship between the aquarium and the city of Long Beach. We extended the lease, which was due to expire in 2031 to 2066, 2060, I should say. Uh, we've been paying $2.15 million a year in rent to the city, and based on our prepaying the rent that we have uh, will owe until 2031, we are now, as of the passage of these items by the city council, going to pay $1 a year in rent for the duration of it, meaning for 45 years, uh, 40 years. Um, and uh, we, and there was a pile of money that we're now div we're dividing up with the city. Uh, 
as a result of changing this relationship, which means that we can do a number of things, including we just hired a new director of education and conservation. And I thought about that while the kids were up here. I shouldn't say kids, but the Poly High School students and their friends, um, uh, because uh, uh, the aquarium has been very involved. The, the client action plan that the city adopted was basically done by the aquarium. Uh, all the work was done on it, and uh, I look for and keep saying we need a better relationship with the aquarium, and now I think the infrastructure is in place. Uh, to do that, and uh, especially with the new vice president for education, and so that's exciting, I think, for the school district. Um, secondly, uh, and this is, I, I forgot about this because it was completely and absolutely Freudian because it lasted about six hours earlier uh, this week. Uh, I am in this Council of Great City Schools program uh, where we're looking at how to do better board governance, and one of the things that we focused on this time, in fact, the thing that we focused on was uh, policy diets and what we can do about policies. James and I have been talking about this. I've been sharing with him what's going on. And uh, uh, in order to do this program, I had to do a bunch of work to identify our board policies, or at least some of our board policies. And I think we've got about 150 of them. And, uh, and I know the district is doing a lot of work right now in looking at what we have and what we need and what needs to be updated and where we have to do reporting. In fact, I think I said to James, where is the building that we house the people that uh, do this kind of work? Because there must be 100 people that have to do all this. But it's very exciting. It's, it's in conjunction with our idea of making our boards focused on student outcomes. It's, uh, focused on uh, getting the materials uh, in a timely manner so that we can work on it. And so uh, uh, this is, been, it's an eight month program. Uh, we're about uh, five months into it and uh, I'm excited about, the, but with the meeting tonight, which was really in many ways the kickoff of that uh, improvements in governments. And I just wanted to share that as well. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief as well. Um, I wanted to say happy first day of school to our students at CAMS and SATO. I know a lot of us are focused on the 31st as the first day of school, but because of their great partnerships with the universities that they share or co-locate on or are near, that they start uh, differently and end a little differently than us. So uh, I hope it was a successful first day for all of those students on those two campuses. Um, and as we kick off, as I said, this 138th year for WSD, I wanted to acknowledge all the hard work that's happened over the summer. Um, while some folks are 10-month employees, we know that not all folks are 10-month employees. Uh, we know that Nutrition Services worked hard to keep our community fed, fed throughout the summer with our partnership with the City of Long Beach. Our facilities and construction teams ramp up and do even more work during the summer. Uh, when they have the opportunity to be on campuses free of, of students and staff. Um, so for those students, you know, some of them I know are going to be working right up until that last minute to make sure everything is in place for schools that are newly renovated or um, helping students relocate uh, to temporary facilities while we work on their schools this year. Um, our Human Resources and Personnel Commission have been working hard to staff up our schools. Um, thank you for that. So uh, we have included and hired over 300 certificated new hires, almost 400 new hires of classified employees this summer. Our business department kept the lights on, uh, kept the bills paid, crunched data, and do all the things, uh, continue to do all the things uh, to keep us running behind the scenes. I didn't get the number of students who were engaged in summer school programming, but I'm sure it's over 10,000. Uh, who were doing that work. 750 teachers worked summer school, 600 classified staff engaged in that summer school work as well. 1,800 teachers and staff went to some kind of training or development. So thank you to all of those who continued to work every day and took time out of what for some is traditionally a break uh, to continue to keep not just our students and staff working but keeping our community fed um, and uplifted. I think that's important to recognize as we move into um, this next phase of year 138. Um, in that consent calendar, and we know we'll get used to the idea that there's a lot of things in there that we'd love to talk about, but that's the point is we got mm -hmm. to have that other great conversation on student outcomes. 
um, was an acknowledgement, um, and I want to congratulate Diana Craighead on her reelection to the Board of Education, the certification of that, um, and Dr. Benitez on his uh, reappointment to another term. He did not have an opponent. Um, so looking forward to continuing to work with both of you, um, and you will be officially sworn again for your new terms in December. Um, so that was one of those things that was buried in there, but wanted to acknowledge. It's great to have you back. Um, um, and I just, uh, an announce, I'll do the announcement now. The Youth Climate, there's a Youth Climate Commission for LA County that's just been announced. So the supervisors want to have a commission um, that is specifically for youth engagement on climate. And so I thought it was prescient that I saw that yesterday. I actually sent out a tweet to our Green Schools friends um, with the link to apply. But for young folks watching, um, you can go onto the LA County site. Um, I'm sure I could have Mr. Itson send something out as well to apply to have your voice heard, not just at a school board or city level, but a county of 10 million people would be a pretty great place to have impact. So we know with the agency seen today that if they've got the time, they'd be great additions. So I would encourage our youth members um, to apply for that. And um, speaking of youth members, I, I, I stopped in on the leadership development as well, and I got to see some of our student leaders from Californians for Justice, who continue to play an important role in how we, the grown-ups in the district, um, can better support them, the young people in the district, uh, straight from their mouths. So watching our young people help train up our, our next generation of leaders is always inspiring so, inspiring. so thank you to Californians for Justice to continue to have that role. And I will pass it to Dr. Baker for her superintendent's report. Great, thank you. I'll be brief and I'm going to actually pass to Mr. Grayson in a moment. Um, Yes, welcome back to Sato and Cams. I did get to Sato this morning and saw lots of happy dragons um, coming in and just filled the school with energy, breathed, breathed life back into their school. So super exciting. Um, and also just I, I appreciate the acknowledgement of hardworking staff in summer. School districts are learning organizations. And so there's kind of a myth that when summer happens that everybody's off. What you represented, Ms. Kerr, we ha actually had more than 15,000 students in summer programming, from enrichment to credit recovery and to, to other programs. So lots of hardworking staff and lots of learning. Learning for our senior team, learning for teachers, um, a, a virtual institute that Dr. Kale and her team put together for learning in follow-up to the last year's Equity Institute. So. Um, school districts are learning organizations, and this summer was definitely um, a summer of learning. Uh, we are counting down the days. So to our students and families, we are ready for you. Nine days left before the first day of school for most of our schools. That includes a day before school where teachers will be on campus setting up, having a learning experience with their own teachers, and a professional day where many schools will be looking at their, their data on the, the Monday. Um, and making plans for their goals and aspirations for their students. So with that in mind, I'm passing to Mr. Grayson to do a good commercial for something that is coming to families. Thank you, Dr. Baker, and uh, thank you to the board for giving me this opportunity. Um, yeah, in the spirit of, of uh, engagement, communications, uh, we are ramping up. I'm sure that if you follow our social media, um, if you follow our YouTube channel, and to all the 2.3 million people who are watching right now, this board meeting, um, we are we're really excited to just be be um, doing some new things. Uh, and one of them is is this back to school guide. So it's not necessarily new. Um, we've done it before, but last year's guide was really focused on health and safety. Um, but as we sat together with the team and, and with Dr. Baker's leadership, we decided, or we kind of thought, what are all of the things that we really needed to tell families? If we could get everyone's attention in a short span or, or, or 10 pages, what could we tell them? And so, um, you know, with our senior team, we got together and just threw out a bunch of ideas, had kind of a little brainstorming session. And um, major kudos to, uh, I'm going to call out names, Chris Eftehue, to Mary Gomez, um, to Craig Foster for really helping pull this together in our duplication department, Chris Itson. Um, all of our communications team and the folks in here, we put together this back to school guide in, in about a week. Um, but to quickly go through it, um, it just includes a letter from our superintendent. Uh, you'll see a back to school checklist, which includes some really important things, um, including, I think, bullet number two. I'll say it because I, I do want all those millions of people to know that you have to check your information in parent view. It's so vital that 
the information in parent view is correct. Um, <clears throat> we cannot communicate with you if we don't have the proper phone numbers, email addresses, and all of those things. So um, those kind of things, we put information about the new school start times, um, having a mask, you know, the fact that they're not uh, required, but they're recommend that they're recommended, um, vaccinations, being aware of social media activity, right? Like that's an important thing that we just saw last year. We want to keep reiterating that social media activity and things like making threats can be uh, can be really detrimental to a student's uh, student life. So, um, and then the last thing is just practicing new routines, right? We all the students are used to their summer routine, and now it's time to start getting back in the in the spirit of. of that school routine. Um, there is a whole spread in the middle about uh, health and safety guidelines for the new school year. And then one thing I'm kind of excited about is, even though this is a really beautiful document, I think after the first day of school, it'd be really neat if they tore out this middle page, which is just a school calendar. Um, it's not in the traditional, you know, kind of boxy calendar mode. It's just important dates throughout the year. So it'd be really cool if parents just tore this page out after after the beginning of the school year and, and posted this on the refrigerator. And here's the coolest thing about this document is that it is in English, but if you flip it over, the entire thing is also just mirrored in Spanish. And so um, just again, major kudos to the entire team. Uh, it'll be in an envelope addressed to each parent. And um, we really hope that it creates a conversation around the dinner table with everyone kind of pulling this document out and, and the parents, guardians, and caregiver, caregivers just reading over this stuff with their, their students. And so really excited to uh, be putting out information like this to, um, to just make sure that it gets in everybody's hands. Just really quickly, the reason why we decided to do a mailer um, as opposed to just a PDF kind of web link document is just because we want every single family to be able to, to tangibly touch and feel something like this and have those, those conversations at home. Can you hold up that envelope one more time? Because it's yeah, super sure. welcoming and I'd be so excited. And I was that kid who couldn't wait for kid, for school to start. So I would see that and I would grab it, I'd take it to my parents, make them yeah. check things off the list. Tried to make it more exciting. Right? We, well we tried. done. Yeah, so families be watching your mailbox for a beautiful envelope with good information about back to school. Um, the last thing is I wrote myself a note and I'll in include Dr. Camarino if he wants to jump in with this week's games. Um, our sports schedule starts, so fall sports, Boys water polo, boys and girls cross country, varsity, JV, frosh soft football, girls golf, girls tennis, girls volleyball. So lots for families and others who just want to support sports to be out. All of those schedules are posted under S Sports on our district website right now. And Dr. Camarino, call out who's playing this Friday. Yeah, we actually, uh, good evening. We actually have some games this year on Thursday nights due to lack of refs and some on Friday nights. So uh, tomorrow we have Polly. Jordan and Milliken playing away, and then Friday night we have uh, Lakewood and Cabrillo hosting. So uh, we'd be there Friday night to host to support uh, Cabrillo Lakewood. But good luck to Polly, Jordan, and Milliken for tomorrow. Thank you. Um, any announcements? Yes. Um, in light of the fact that we're getting back to school, getting back into that routine of uh, dropping off our kids as parents. I encourage everybody to be safe out there, um, especially when we change our routine from, you know, families doing other things during the summer till everybody everybody converging on, on those school sites. And we have schools like Hughes and Longfellow right next to each other and Stanford and Prisk right next to each other, uh, Lowell and Rogers. Those neighborhoods get so impacted. So I'm just encouraging everybody to be safe watch out for kids um, crossing the street and be mindful of the neighbors don't draw, don't block driveways don't double park that sort of thing just just a reminder everybody be safe out there yeah i think that's a great point and we're in the, we're in the habit of being able to cruise through town a little more quickly because we don't have 60,000 kids going to school and 10,000 employees going to work back on this schedule. So as the streets fill up, please allow extra time. Um, walk if you can, walk with a buddy, ride a bike um, to help with the congestion and, and be extraordinarily safe. We all know that we lost a student this summer um, in a traffic fatality. So let's thank you for the reminder, Ms. Craighead. Um, with that, I'm gonna close the meeting in honor of Bobby Smith. 
So we lost the amazing Bobby Smith over the summer just a couple of weeks ago. Bobby Smith was the first African American elected to the LBUSD board. She was elected in 1988 and served until 2004 and completed four terms as board president during an era of major reforms that earned national recognition, including the implementation of school uniforms and standard-based instruction. Uh, she was succeeded on the board by Dr. Williams and now um, Mr. Miller in that area. We know that her legacy is about equality. She's remembered for wanting to make the world a better place and did so by making sure that equity and excellence could be found in every corner, not only of our system, but in District 6 where she lived as well and had such an outsized influence on our Long Beach community. Um, I am grateful to serve um, in the same space that she did. And one of the biggest events I got to go to right after being elected in 2014 was the renaming of a school in her honor, which was so incredibly well-deserved um, with a beautifully um, redone library as well. And she also served as a librarian at Long Beach City College. So a great uh, testament to her legacy. She had a smile that lit up the room and she was a mentor to many. And so we close tonight in her honor. We will miss her and we will continue to work hard to carry out her legacy. Thank you. See you next time.